I'll do the last one. <laughs> and and swivels well. Thank you, sir. I'll give it back to you in the night. Plus a bonus. Okay, we'll get started. All, the other gentleman's running late, but we'll get started this time. <laughs> Last time, the gentleman said it'd be 20 minutes and then he didn't turn up because there was an accident at the radio. It was a drama. Anyhow. Um, so, welcome along tonight. You like, if you don't know each other besides each other, you're welcome to introduce each other. We're all fishermen and we're all here for the same thing, and that's to learn. So, you're welcome to share your knowledge with each other. And, and so, some of you might. Who doesn't have a boat here, by the way? Okay, there's a boat. So, if you. If any of you would like to introduce yourself to a person that doesn't have a boat, maybe they might become a good fisherman, or whatever. Or if you're looking for crew, all good, okay? Um, so last time we had a few guys do that same scenario as well. So what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to tell you about uh, fishing the deep. So in the uh, last seminar we just did was um, fishing around that 100 to 150 metre mark, which is mainly pearl perch. I will cover a bit of that tonight because it's just off the Richter scale at the moment. Um, for those of you who haven't been getting pearlies, if I can make you get pearlies after my little talk. Um, and then we're going to venture out to around about sort of that 240 to 280, 300 metre mark. And then uh, we'll go from there to around about 350, and then from there to about 450 to about 600, okay? And cover all those areas. The area we're looking at today is pretty well the, what I call the Gold Coast area, which is like Point Lookout down to Brunswick Head, so. Not being a bit of chauvinist and stealing more people's land, but <laughs> but for me that's the Gold Coast zone, and it's around about uh, you got 28 north and about 28 in the south, so it's around about um, 60 nautical miles, which is about 110 k's in area. We went from there to there. Okay, um, so for those of you who I keep always emphasising to understand your GPS is very important for many reasons, including the safety aspects. So, and when you're out there. In that depth, as some of you might know, that fish out in that deep water, that you've got current, you've got wind, you've got a lot of things to battle. And a lot of people I know say, oh, you spend too much time talking about the weather, but it's about your safety. So when you're going at sort of 60 k's offshore, you want to make sure the safety aspect is you know what to do. Because if it comes up big, strong westerly or the current picks up against the 20 knot southerly, it can get a bit ugly out there. Okay? Maybe a bit of swell on, whatever it might be. But um, just remember the latitude, which is the, the one that runs horizontal. So Point Lookout's on about 28, 28, and Tweed, uh, Brunswick's on about 28, 30, 34, 36. So it's nearly uh, 60 nautical miles. Every time that little number goes one, you go one mile south of Point Lookout, it goes from 28, uh, sorry, 27, 28 to 27, 29. So you've got one mile south. Every time it goes one number, it's a mile, nautical mile, which is 1.8 k's. Okay? And so if you go east, every time it changes, it's another mile. So really important to understand that. And, and you can look at this, this sheet I've got here and I can look at any of those numbers and know exactly where it is without even looking at the map. Once you get to that stage, you can learn a lot quicker because you know where you are in relation to the land and uh, how far out it is. And, um, and it, it'll come to you really quick. Especially if someone's talking numbers, you can quickly put that in your head and without even pretending you know, and then you've got it for his spot for next time. <laughs> Knowing people's spots is very important. 
Um, by the way, was anyone out on the uh, 50 Fathom Reefs northeast last Monday at all? In here? No, I'm out Monday? Probably people out on that. <laughs> on the YouTube thing, that uh, might have been. But um, we always, like, when we fish in deep water, you always try and keep your spot a bit secret because it takes so much time that to find your spots, right? Um, and for many, many, we've been doing it since the late 90s, and for many, many years, um, people always ask me, and I give them the vicinity, but you've got to know, you've got to know how to do it still. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a saviour. People don't know how to deep drop until we do these sort of classes. Then you guys learn pretty quick. Um, and then with the advent of uh, some of the apps that are out as um, like whatever sort of mapping system you, you guys are using, whether it be Garmin or be um, uh, Navionics or whatever it might be, the, the resolution on the bottom is so easy now to find spots and it's so accurate. Like we've been, well, we've gone over areas before, but probably at speed and uh, never had, like we've seen obviously little dips and whatever, but you're not really zooming in too much at speed. Um, but when you've got these apps and you look at them, oh, there's a little bit of a canyon there or a little bit of a, a ravine or a little bit of a rise and you go there, it's, it is there. And it's like, wow, I've never fished that. I've driven over it like 50 times, you know. So we're just now working those spots and absolutely nailing it. There's fish everywhere. There's so much spot, it's, there's so much ground here. So hence I don't mind sharing the marks because what I thought was only like 10 marks has now become 10,000 marks out there. <laughs> there's a lot of ground. So. It's all though based on the depth, okay? So we all know 50 fathoms is around 90 meters along our coastline, and then it sort of drops off, so that the bottom's like that, and then all of a sudden it goes like that, at that sort of 50 fathom mark. That's where the shelf starts to, or what I call it the inner shelf, it starts to drop off. And then you've got little bumps along there, little ridges along there, little canes along there, little, uh, little bounds along there, along that edge. Um, and then some areas it'll go sort of like, so that's a, the gradual fall from the shoreline out to 100 metres and then it sort of changes angle like that and then it may drop out flat in like the 220 metre mark or 260 metre mark and then it'll all of a sudden drop again at around 300 down to 350. This is like the bottom here. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry about the rods. <laughs> uh, but there's little bumps all the way along. So they're all in metres but the bottom shelf is pretty well, sorry I get a bit wavy guys. The bottom shelf is pretty well like that and I explained this last time but You've got, like, that's 12 fathom reef, 18 fathoms, 24, 36 is uh, 42 fathoms, 50 fathoms has a bit of a rise, and then the angle all of a sudden changes, okay? And then you've got sort of like 120 to 130 metres, which is a really good pearl digger rounds, okay? And bar, small bar cod. And then your next sort of grounds are sort of that um, 180 to 250 grounds, so you get um, a little bit of a rise, sort of come from sort of 220, 230, back up to 210, or... Um, 230 up to 210 or 240 to 210. It'll come up from sort of 20, 30 metres on a slow mound and then it goes back down again. And then the next rise is around that sort of 280 metre mark. And then, uh, then you get 300, like I said before, and that'll, there's another one about 350. And then you've got like your gyms and Riviera grounds and all that sort of stuff in that four to 500 metre mark. Most of that's in sort of nearly 500 and coming back up again to 400. And then you've got um, uh, the ledge sort of drops off pretty deep at 600. There's a bit of bit of edges on 600 metres, and then you've got stuff like sort of mixed mountain that comes from 1100 up to about 800 on the top. So it's a 300 metre rise. It's fairly substantial. Um, we have dropped out there twice and lost baits once. Don't know what it was. Um, it's very hard to fish that depth. We were using six kilo lead uh, with mere nines uh, in the real size. Um, I'd love to see the what they are on the bottom, the bottom out there is about 150, 200 metres of something on the bottom, I don't know what it is. It's not scatter layer, it's fish, I don't know what sort of fish they are. Um, but out on these mounts out here, um, which we're going to talk about tonight later, um, there's plenty of fish. So, fish species wise, at obviously 80 to about, um, sort of 180 metres is about the deepest I've ever caught pearlies, um, but out here they're really thick between 100 and about 130 to 140 metres. Um, and then once you get out past there, um, obviously you get bar smaller bark clots sort of around that, uh, that size in with your pearlies. You don't get many really big ones. You get the big big cod cods, like the sort of estuary type cod, mixed up with them, so I feed on the pearlies. Um, you get pig fish and that sort of stuff. Once you get out to um, around that sort of 
220 to 280 meter mark, you get flame snapper will start. Um, you'll get uh, lots of barcode of all sizes, but predominantly around that 8 to 20 kilo size. And then um, you'll get other species. All you normally get is snapper, pigfish, kingfish, you get all that as well. Um, the divas I caught snapper up to is about 280 meters, but someone said they caught one recently in 320. Um, and only like 50 centimeter ones. Um, I've caught flathead to 320. Someone said they caught one today at 350 meters. So if you're a good flathead fish, you your chance. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I've caught uh, uh, flame snapper out to 350 meters, which we got just recently, two weeks ago, which is the first time we've got one that deep. Uh, but the size is substantial, it's a meter 25, which is a little bit spread out. So it's around about eight or nine kilos, a good size one. Um, I have caught them that one that size just under uh, in about 260 to 240 meters. So we obviously moved around a bit, but it seems to be the, uh, the average size out further is a bit better. We got some the other day in 280 meters on Monday, and they were around that sort of, uh, they're probably around five or six kilos, a good size too, four, four to six kilos. Um, but once you get out, I haven't caught flame snapper over 350 now. Um, but you've got um, other fish out there which are alphonse, so you get other species starting. So alphonse is like a, do you all know what a sweep looks like? Purple thing, little grey thing. They actually are not too bad eating when, when you only catch them starting from baker. But um, they are like that sort of shape, but they're red and they're a lot bigger. Like that. Is that what you had caught the other day? Um, my mate Tony did. Yeah, yeah, yeah I wasn't on the boat, I was spilling too, by the way. It was, it was in the boat. <laughs> Yeah, it's in the photo, that's yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, was, that was pretty good. That was the boat run the week before, which you got the 1.25 one, that's uh, flaming. And then you got the, the Alphonse the other day, but in the same area, so 350 metres. Um, but they'll, they'll, they'll hang into it probably around 500 metres deep. Um, and then um, you get other things like Ruby Snapper. There's a lot of Ruby Snapper out here too. That's the next thing I haven't got out here yet, but I've got some customers that do get them. Obviously, people look at Seagrove on their marks. but uh, they're predominantly between 300 and about 400 metres, okay? So if you fish up water, it's the same scenario, guys. Same same ridges, same everything. Everything's the same on our coastline. you just got sand gaps in between, okay? Um, then once we get out to, um, say, like Riviera Grounds or, um, or Jimmy's Mountain, where it comes from sort of 480, nearly 500, and it'll come up to about sort of 400, 420, on the top and then I'll drop down to sort of 600 on the back side and keep going. Um, that's where we get a lot of blue eye, uh, Travella, and we get bass groper, so either you get the bigger size cod and you get, uh, you get bass, I've got bass groper in about 350 actually, but predominantly 400 metres and deeper. Uh, and you'll get um, uh, gem fish and I've got gem fish too in 200 metres as well, but they seem to hang around that depth, that 450, 500 metre mark. Um, Distance-wise, to give you some idea too, if you went straight at front and found reef, um, obviously 50 fathoms is about 40 k's out, your um, 200, 280 metre marks are around about straight out the front here, probably around about uh, 48 k's to 50 k's, and your um, 400 metres to 5, 600 metres is around where it starts to really drop off, is around about sort of uh, 58 k's, roughly speaking, say the gym, so it's better off. Yeah. Uh, so that's the sort of distance. So just remember each ledge is about 10 k's apart. So if you just want to go to the next one, it's just another 15 minutes out on a good day. Okay, but remember you've got to come back if it flows westerly, <laughs> which is a scary part. Um, if any, has anyone ever caught, fished in that depth before in here? No, okay. Anyone fished in this 500 meter mark before? Sydney or Browns Mountain? Browns Mountain, exactly right there, good mate, yeah. And you caught blue eye and... Yeah, blue eye oh, and gemfish. Gemfish, that's right. Um, how about 300 to 350 metres? Bring you out there on the Okay. <laughs> Anyone else here at all? Yeah, okay. And uh, around that 280 metre mark? No? Okay. It's not, I'm going to make you guys get out there. If you want to 80 to 90. Sorry? 80 to 90. 80 to 90, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's how much balls you've got every time you those numbers. Yeah, that's right. Um, once you get used to it, it's, it's like going when you first went from 36 to 50s, okay? It's like that feeling. 
So it's once you've been there, you just go straight past every six to fifty fathoms because it's just so easy. It's the same going from fifty fathoms out to say Jeepers Mount. It's just another half hour, twenty minutes, twenty k's further, and um, it's not too bad as long as your weather's ten, fifteen knots sort of thing. Um, well, Wayne will tell you if you got a bit of southerly wind blowing at twenty knots and you got a bit of current um, against it, like in summer, say two or three knots, and and two meter swell plus out there, two and a half meters. They stand up quite steep, the waves from the south will cap on the top, they'll break. So that's, that's big. it's like the seaway and the run out tide, same scenario. About similar tidal flow can flow that fast too, and, uh, and it gets a bit ugly. But the swell's bigger out there. That's not too bad this time of year, right? No, this year's beautiful. So, like we we're there on Monday in 350 metres, or 280 metres, 300 metres, and it was uh, 0.6 of a knot. So a lot of people don't understand, it's not the current at the moment, it's the wind. So people say, oh, it's still too, too much current. Well, that's not right. Um, the other day we used my brother's boat and he's got the Captain Helm, whether it's the thing that holds you on the spot. It's a single motor though. Um, and we would, we knew there wasn't much current, it's like 0.6 or 0.5 or not. And we just got really slowly until we actually got the best shot of fish on the bottom and then just spot locked the motor and it just locks you on the position, and you just drop straight down, and we're using, I was only using a kilo of lead, which is that size there, and I was, I was like, I think it's a kilo, 1.1, and um, it was straight down. There was no current, okay? Uh, but when we drifted, we were drifting at about 1.6 knots, because it was, I mean, it's only blowing about eight knots, but it's the wind, so if you've got 15 knots, you're probably doing two knots of drift. So it's not the current, it's the wind. It's not until you actually hold yourself that you realize there's no current. So, um, I'm not saying you should have a helm on your, that sort of thing on your boat, but um, reversing up does the same effect, you reverse up. So you've got to learn to reverse, and it's really uh, easy to do in most situations, but not when it's, when it's rough, because you get a wave over the back and you boat up. Make sure your bilge pump works before you go out there. Anyway, okay. <laughs> um, so you'll, you'll understand that. So I think what we'll do is we'll start the pearlies, and I'm going to work my way out to around about um, well, who wants to go out to like 280 metres? How many guys here want to try and get out there? And how many of you guys have got boats uh, over five and a half, six metres? Most of you have, okay. Um, anyone here have boats under six metres? Okay. So have you got a ski boat? No, you got a boat. You got a boat, okay, cool. So um, when, um, when you understand, yeah, the, you probably understand the sea anyhow, but when you understand it properly, um, I'd probably just go with another boat. That's the best way to do it and just follow each other around. Um, I don't mind you guys following us out, as long as it's not like a, like a follow the leader thing. <laughs> just one, one or two boats maybe. You know, you, you know yourself, if you see all the two boats on the spot and they're stopped, that means they're bottom fishing, right? And the next minute, everyone just goes through. And that was what I was getting back to before. Boat GPS. Yeah, sorry? The boat GPS. Yeah, boat GPS, that's right. So on Monday when we were out there, um, we were going to our pearly spot, the 100 metres. There was a boat sitting near it, but not on it. It's about probably, four or five minutes away, we thought he might not know it, so we'll just get going past him. We sacrificed, went to the next spot up a bit further, and then that boat followed us. <laughs> and we went past all the boats on the Kingy Reef, it was like, um, I think two of them were coming to us, there was already two boats or three boats there now. And then there was like six of us there, and I said, holy Jesus, this is like, we can't go back that way. <laughs> we can't go to the next spot, which is a really good spot. So let's just um, go. So we just sacrificed and we went. We didn't, we got a couple of fish there, but we had to drive 10 k's north until they all dropped off. So we're going. Day. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's actually, my, well, it was a new boat. It was in my brother's view, but, uh, but we. You um, need a new hat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they knew who we were. Um, Paul had his mouth pulled once. There was one guy pulled up about from here, the back wall away from us, like drove all the way up to us and then just pulled up there and started chicken. I'm like, oh, jeez, he's going. So Paul got a bit, but anyhow, he called, I think it's a thing on TV called edit, edit, see, edit, edit, see, in a boat, um, and what not to do, hand in on the boat, you know. But um, it's uh, all about knowing uh, other grounds. So you've got to know lots of grounds, so you can actually sacrifice those and go straight to the next really good spot, which we did. We went 10 k's north. Um, the pearlies are just laid on, like we bagged out in no time, you know. Actually, we threw back probably five or six that were around 50 centimetres. So, um, and see at the bottom, it was straight on. 
So I think I'll start there. Is that right? And then we'll work our way out. So a lot of you guys are still... How many of you guys come to the last seminar? About three or four of you. Okay, so if you guys... Sorry if I repeat myself just a little bit real quickly. But um, it, the Pearl Perch this year are like... Um, perhaps... Uh, are you guys not too hot in here? Is that all right? Is that a bit cool? If it's a bit, not a bit cool, let me know. Um, it's... We were at two Saturdays ago, right? And it was the best pelpert session I've had in my life fishing 40 years off the Gold Coast here, including back in the day when there wasn't many boats around. I don't know, they've just... Uh, obviously, the, the, our fisheries are really sustainable. And um, I couldn't believe it. And obviously, the bag was four, so the first drift, there was six of us on a boat. We're on a 40-foot cat. Um, and we um, had the first drift. I think we got 14 fish in the first, like, five minutes in one or two drops that has come up. And they're all 50 centimetre plus up to about 60. So you're talking like two to three or four kilo of pearl perch. Um, we didn't drift much, there wasn't much drift, so we just went back to the spot that was about 100 metres away, dropped down again. Uh, we were using, um, we ran about sort of 20 ounce sinkers. So please learn, I know it's hard work if you have an electric reel, but you need to learn, learn to use in the deep heavy sinkers, as simple as that. If you don't get down there, it's not like float lining for snapper. It doesn't work that way out there. You need to get to the bottom and have your line slack on the bottom. That's how it works. So um, if you're using uh, electric, right, um, and you're, you, we fish electrics out of the rod holder, but you need to have your line uh, like never um, like really tight and never too far behind the boat. So you need to back up if that's the case and just slowly just um, edge up a little bit of the slack line or wind it up as you're backing back. So then it's sort of tight, slack, tight, slack. As soon as you get that slack, they'll, they'll just bite, which I'll show you on the video a bit later, okay? Um, and that's how you do it. And if you if you like using spot lock or something like that, then you need to um, have your line at, because there's no, not much drift at the moment, uh, just, as I said before, loose, tight, loose, tight, because there's no current pulling it, okay? Uh, but if your line's like that, and if there's a little bit of current and you haven't got enough weight on, and just because you have a line and you get a bell in your line, it's very hard to feel the bites and you're wasting all that fuel and time and effort. So put on the big mother if you have to, because that's how to catch a fish. Okay. Um, but we'll talk about sinks a bit later. Um, so anyhow, we'll talk about the pearl list now. So we um, we drop down and straight away, uh, boom, 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 rod's just going crazy. Um, my son at that time, this is a couple of Saturdays ago, my son Jack was jigging with um, the canis jigs and flat style jigs. He was getting smacked on the way down straight, probably at about 90 metres in the 110. He was getting hit really hard. Um, a couple of guys, because we've been fishing for kingies earlier, they still had live rigs on, so they put live baits on. They got nailed the running up to the bottom. We thought they were little kingies, but they were big pearlies. And uh, in no time, next minute, there's like 12 or 14 pearl is on the deck all that size <laughs> we're going holy shit and so we um we went back another drop and we got 16 on the next drop so we had to throw back six over 50 centimeters and, and drive away and go chase some flames down because we really bagged out our pearlies unless we have fun and throw them back all the time but we're really done enough of that so within half an hour we were out of there with, with like 24 massive pearl perch what time of the day was that that was around about um probably eight 8.30, 9 o'clock until about 11. Yeah. I find pearl perch, um, you will get, um, we have caught it in the dark. Jack and I last year got one, uh, two in the dark at 4 a.m. because it's the bite time finish that, um, well, I read bite times a lot with the moon going down and sort of stuff. And it was finishing around 7.30. So we were trying to get like three hours in before the, of the, before the moon disappeared. So we went out at like three from Renault Bay and went south this time in about 100 metres again. So all the pearls, I keep saying, they're on the back side of the 50s. They're not on the front side. They're not on the top. It's snapper and the kingies are, but the pearl is on the, on the down edge in the wire weed. That's where the wire weed is. And, um, yeah, we got 175 and 73 centimetres at 4 a.m. in the morning. I couldn't believe that. That's the first time I've ever done that. So I caught one pearl once for float lining at night time on the 36s many years ago. Um, that was a big one too. Uh, but I'd never caught many pearl perch in the dark. They simply got the bite. Their happy time seems to be between about 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. They're, I don't know, they worship the sun or something, but <laughs> that seems to be their happy time. 
And if you get them, like at the moment, just please understand guys, at the moment you've got the new moon. So new moon, you can't see the sky, but it's in the sky all day. You just don't see it, it's like the dark side of the moon, as they call it. So the fish will theoretically bite all day. As soon as that moon starts to come up and do the full moon, so the next two weeks, it comes up later in the day, so that it might not come up till like nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, so next Wednesday, Thursday, roughly speaking. Um, so you won't get many fish before that time. You'll see that you might get a bit morning bite and get a couple of snapper. Then as soon as the, um, uh, it, that's finished and you've got seven till nine, 30, 10 o'clock before the moon comes up, you'll do nothing, you'll get nothing. You'll drift around. You'll, sometimes some guys are bail and go home because they've got fish aren't body. But hang in there because at 10 o'clock, wham, bam, they'll just come on. And that's how it works out here in the deep water. Now it's the same on the 200 meters, 300, 400, 500 meters, same scenario. Okay. Um, and then as the moon gets uh, later and bigger in the sky at night time, um, the fishing reverses to night time. So you catch all your mull away and stuff like that at night time and not, don't fish in the day. Oh, yes, please do. Yeah, thank you. I'll repeat everything when it comes up. Not quite that. <laughs> um, so um, you need to try and pull that through together, but if there's no current, the fish are quite full, okay? Because they're feeding it's really easy. It's really easy for them to go and get a feed. They can just get, swim around and eat everything they want. So when we got the pearlies the other day, two Saturdays ago, it was 1.6 knots, a bit of current that day. Um, last Monday, it was only 0.6, so it dropped a bit more. Um, the other day, I think they just come out from their big swim, wherever they rock up from, they just turned up because they, they ran out there two weeks ago, now I can tell you that now, so we've been out every couple of weeks in that area trying for them, hoping they'll come in, and they showed up on that Saturday. Um, they were totally empty, so they just like inhaled anything you dropped down to them. Um, and when we, when we clean them, we always check their stomachs, and they were just dead empty, except for the, the liveys or whatever they'd eaten off us, it's shoved right at the back of their guts, they just inhaled it. Um, the jigs were right, the hooks were right down their throat. Um, so um, the ones we caught last Saturday, um, or last uh, Monday, sorry, this week, they were chock a block because the current's dropped off, they're feeding already, and they were full of like little crabs and little fish, lots of lots of stuff that was smelt, <laughs> and the guts were chock a block. So they've been feeding, but once that current picks up again, um, welcome, Andy, how you going? Right. Yeah, good, mate, thanks. Um, once they, um, they're still obviously going to feed, but when they're swimming in the current, you've got a little bit of current, you've got like one or two knots of current out here, that is the perfect scenario. They actually bite better than they do in, in 0.6 knot of a current. Thanks, Liam. Cheers, mate. Front door's all done. Mm -hmm. Folks, just to let you know too, there's a set of keys that are left in the front door. If ever, I have a heart attack or something, or there's a fire, the keys are there, you just turn the key in the outside, okay? And the same scenario downstairs here, there's no key there, but it's, um, you can just unlock it by hand. Okay. Um, well, it's just seminars on, um, for future reference. Um, <laughs> um, so, the pearlies are, re are really biting well at the moment. Yeah. Did you say that's at the 120, around the pearlies at 120? On the back yep. of the 90? Yep. The, on the back of the 90, there'll be some there, and yeah. then that one, 110, 120 stuff, mainly, there's a bit of it out the front here, but it's predominantly from the jumping pin north up to look out. Yeah. That's south. And down south, same scenario. So down off the tweed, uh, off uh, Burley Heads, it starts again. A bit of a gap between out the front here and Burley. And then once you get about 28.06 or 08, tweed's on about 28.10. So about off, say, Burley or Kira. Um, it, it's really good grounds down there in that 100 metre line. Plenty of wide weed, plenty of really big pearlies, as, as I said in the last year, the huge ones. Uh, we've always fished down that way too. And then further south, once you get south of Tweed, how many guys here fish south of Tweed? You guys should, it's such a good, if you, that's if you got, obviously, your boat on a trailer. Um, tweed bars are a bit tricky though, and if you, we normally just go from the seaway down. To go down that way is actually similar distance to go that way. It's the same, like to go up where the really good pearly grounds are, you're about 60k north. And it's about 60k down if you're down on, say, um, Cabaret or something. You know, from the bar. From the bar. Yeah, I was. I was yeah. yeah. I thought the GPS would tell me bullshit. If you wear glasses yeah. or contacts. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so it's about 60k. But again, um, we're sport down here. 60k sounds a long way, but it's nothing. 
it is something that's a bit rough, but it's, it's nothing. Because um, I won't play the other one. So. Uh, yeah, no time. Um, but uh, when you go, like I say, you go up uh, with Gladstone, that's like, or off 77, that's the average run out to the reef. When you, and, and 80k is going to go to the shelf on the other side of, the, of Musgrove or something. And when you're up off, say, Early Beach, you want to get to good spots on the reef, it's, it's a 100, 120k run on Mackay, you know. So that's their average run they do on five, six metre boats. They choose the weather right and fuel. <laughs> um, but so get used to your boats and, and get your mates to chip in for the fuel, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, and just try and get a little bit further because the fishing is just uh, so, so much better. Okay? That's what tonight's all about, to teach you guys how to get a lot of fish. And, uh, and obviously they've got bag of them, so you can't go raping it. And as I said, there's so many grounds that really don't exist and we find these new grounds. And, and the weather, the current, the current runs so hard six months a year, you can't fish the deep. And then the day you do get off, it blows 20 knots, or the swell's three metres, and you can't really get out there. So it's very protected, okay? It's only winter's the only chance we have to fish it, and it's for about three months. It's from now till September, October. What did you say before yeah. it was good for the pearlies of the daytime zone the dark at the moon? Yeah, know? exactly right, Wayne. Yeah. yeah, although two weeks ago we got in three days for the full moon. Yeah. Um, don't know what happened there, but <laughs> yeah. but I think they just rocked up. They're hungry. I don't know where they come from. I'd love to know where they come from because yeah. they're not schooled up on the sound at all. But they were the other day. They're like 10 or 15 metres thick. Yeah, so on the sounder. Um, you, it's just, it was crazy fishing. And it's the same on Monday, we're at the same deal. We, um, we're using jigs, like just uh, like counterside jigs, I was saying, and just getting absolutely smacked. You wouldn't have to do one lift and you're really on. Yeah. And if you drop that one, you just drop back down, you get straight back on. It's quick and easy. And not much, like, I think we might have got one the other day, it was 40 centimetres or 44 maybe. You can tell by the size of the mouth. Pearlies don't look that big, but their mouths are the giveaway. So if their mouth's like sort of 100 mil across, it's, it's like three kilos or two kilos. And if it's like 150 across, that's about four or five kilos. So when, when you look at Pearlie's mouth shot, <laughs> it's very hard to see the length on a Pearlie. Um, it, it's usually some idea of the size. Okay, so the other day we were using rigs like this for Pearlie's. So I'll just pass these two hooks around actually. So we're using these little Lumo Aido hooks. Um, I really like these on Pearl Perch. And my rig's like that style, okay? So we're running like a Aido circle a bead um, and a little skirt above it, Lumo skirt, Lumo eyes or Lumo tube, doesn't really matter. Um, and we're using around 130, this one's actually a bit heavier, but 130 brand, a main and 100 pound branch line. When we jump up to the barcode scenario, you'll see, that one there is actually made more for barcode than pearlies, that's actually 200 main and 130 branch or 150 branch. Okay. Um, as we get a bit deeper, the, the spacings between the hook increases as well because you don't want the fish slap each other in the head when you hook up. Because quite often you get two or three fish. And um, it's really important that you uh, space that out and understand how to put the bait on the hooks is really important. I'll try to take a sec. But understanding the hook size is really important, even more important. <laughs> so they're the same size hook, right? Um, I'll pass these around a sec. The green one is the one we normally use for pearlies, but I have put cod up to about 20 kilos on that. Um, not intentionally, but just get the odd one, like I said, in the pearly grounds. Um, the next size up hook, which is this fellow here, is the same size hook in gape size. I passed both around. But it's about uh, three times the thickness. Three times the thickness, uh, similar style, but that'll hold even a, a 30 kilo blue eye, or a 40 kilo cod, 50 kilo cod. So the thing we're changing is we're spacing it out to about a metre now instead of about 700 between our hooks and our branch becomes a bit longer, goes out to maybe 500 long or 300 long. And uh, we um, are running a heavier line, so running around about a uh, 250 to 300 main and about a, um, about a 200 branch uh, or 150 branch. 150 is still enough for, like for most fish. Um, some of the big cod I caught are right down in their gills, but because they're circle hooks, most of them are hooked in the, in the lip, in the mouth. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story the other day. It's talking about lips, it just reminded me. I, I did have it on here, but I told my wife not, we didn't put it on. But I was digging around to the canister, right? 
and on the pearl perch, so I got a good one on, and then I had it on for maybe 30 seconds, and now I dropped it halfway up, and I was spewing, and I wound it up, wound my Lucanus jig up, and it's got the white uh, long tails on the skirt, two, two of them, and or not sorry, it's on the mouth. When I pulled it up, it had three tails. I go, <laughs> two tails. What's happened here, you know? So I got a bit close to put my glasses on, and I looked at it, and it was sorry about this, the greenies here, <laughs> but it was the full lip off the big off a big pearl perch that looked like an otherwise straight hand <laughs> and it was well hooked. So I must have ripped his lip off. Anyway, you get that. Sorry about that. <laughs> but anyhow, it was quite funny at the time, but not for the fish. Oh yeah, they grow back apparently. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so to say. Okay, so that's our pearly rig. Then the next rig we're going to go to is um, like the ones you guys got in your bag. Okay, so this one here we're running about a 300 main and about um, 150 branch again. We don't change the branch ones much for two reasons. One is you don't need to. Like rarely, I don't think I've ever been bar sharks bite me off. I've never been, uh, I've never shaved that and lost the fish. They have been shaped on some fish I've caught and had to, had to cut off and retire uh, or recrimp it, but it gives the bait a lot more flexibility in the current, and I believe it, it works a lot better than a stiff rig, um, 200 or 300 pound branch line. So keep your branches at even 130. 130's about the minimum, 150's perfect, okay? Um, with your swivels, that, that the style we're using here, um, there's lots of different varieties, and I was speaking to a gentleman before, bought some offers. At one time we couldn't get these, we still can't get them for about another two weeks. Um, this is nothing available in Australia. Um, but uh, uh, there's cheaper ones, but as we saw, they, they broke. Um, but get yourself good quality ones in these. Okay, We normally carry good quality ones, but at the moment we just can't get them. The other one, which is the swivel on the swivel, so it looks a bit like uh, this style of thing. So you've got a bigger, a bigger loop there, you've got the barrel part, which is the, the crane swivel. Smaller there, and then it has another swivel off that side there, right? and that spins 360 around. So that's the one you run your branch line on, and that's the one you run your main line on, and that's the one you run your, down to the next rig. So that's all crimped on, crimped there, crimped there, and crimped here. But it's not like your box style three three way swivel that only turns on the one side. This actually spins all the way around. So those big cod, when they come up, they've got big mouths, same the blue eye, and they'll spin all the way up. Okay. Um, so that type of swivel is really good. Um, and they're on, I think, some of you guys have got that rig and some have got the, the better crimp ones as well. Um, but you see the space on there is about a metre, okay? And you'll see that that's about 400 long, the branch. Four or 500. Um, the biggest swivel, it goes to the top of your line. The little swivel goes to your dropper rig. This one down here. That's the wrong way around. <laughs> That's the top of the line. <laughs> That's the bottom one down here. Um, so on this one here, and, and same mm -hmm. for pearly fishing, and they're all types of fish, um, because your main line is like 130 mm -hmm. or 150 minimum on the pearly, so even 100 even, um, my breakaway is going to be around about 100 as well. It's never going to break at 100, it's always going to break at the knot at maybe 70 or 80 pounds if you're using 100 pounds. So I run about a, a metre and a half, I run quite a long dropper, even I'm only using like that size sinker. Um, I believe most of the better fish are a fair way off the bottom, just a little bit. Uh, even when I'm fishing for snapper I'm, and I'm just uh, using a pat noster, uh, my sinker's at least that high off the bottom to the floor. Um, you know yourself, you know, your better fish are always taken generally up the top of your line. So it just helps a bit more, I think. Um, so. Also, it, my hooks don't foul up on the bottom as easy, or in the wire weed as bad. Most of your wire weed is only about that long, and my hooks, my first hook is just above it sort of thing, you know? So, um, and it's easy for the pearlies to, to see the bait as well. And same thing with the deep water fish. Um, sinker size, as I said, use the biggest sinkers you want. How many people here have electric reels? Okay, those of you who do, seems like most of you do, for those of you who do, it, Utilize you, the reels doing the work, not you. Okay, so utilize the biggest sinker you can use to get down. Not that I'm trying to sell lots of big sinkers, but, but it just works a lot better, like I was saying to you. That you could have that sinker on the bottom and have that stuck in the line. Okay. Um, so 1.1 kilo, uh, or, or say three pounds, I'm using that around up to 
even 240 meters if I can get away with it, this, or 280 meters if I can squeeze the other day in 280 meters. This is straight down. Um, your three to four pound sinkers, um, which is a size is two point, it's two point three kilos, I think. So that's around um, around five pounds. Um, that one we're using anywhere between sort of. Um, if, if it's real strong current, I'll use that even in like one hundred and fifty meters. Okay, or if we got a lot of wind. Or thanks, mate. Does that go way down the back one? Yeah. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Um, so I'd use that even in, in shallow, but I use that out to four or five hundred meters most time. Will get me down in the, at this time of year. Um, in summer or November, when the fishing is quite good, the fish really come on when it's current. As I said before, when, when there's current, they're working hard, they're hungry. They've got to keep eating because they're hungry. So I've had a few pro guys that I've fished with over the years, and they've always taught me, no run, no fun. Lots of run, lots of fish, hard work though. Okay, so I remember my my best catches ever out on Jim's Mountain um, were was when it was running at about three knots. And we're drifting about four to five k's of drift. I didn't realize the, drift, the reef was that big out there, but obviously it runs bits and pieces all the way along. Um, and we'd have to go up around about 800 meters to a cave before we hit the bottom to allow for the dropping of the line to the spot. Another thing we'll talk about in a moment, which is really important, is positioning your boat. But um, so four kilos, which is around 10 pounds, that's, that's as heavy as I probably want to use, but we have used two of those. Okay, the hardest part with that is dropping your line down because the reel just wants to go spastic, it just wants to go crazy overrun. You put your thumb on there, you burn the top of your thumb off. So, what do you do? You have to either use gloves, although I think some of the reels you now, like the Beastmaster that they have and the Force Master has it too, they have like a overrun control and the motor cuts in and puts pressure on it so it doesn't overrun. Crazy, it knows, I don't know how it knows, but it knows. Um, so that's a really hard part with using those. When you deploy your line, safety aspect here, um, well first we're talking about baiting up, I'll tell you So when you bait up your hooks, really important. Um, I use pilchers everywhere, okay? It's, for me, it's my burly. I've been even closer, it's my fishing bait, but, but out in the, over, over 100 metres or whatever. Um, I, I try to use the eye section of it, the tails, I put those away in the freezer for mackerel, burly, whatever. So I cut them in half and I use the eye. So I put the eye through first and then I put on a strip of mullet or a strip of squid. Mullet preferably over 200 metres deep. Squid up to about 200 metres. Just remember that. You get a lot more fish on mullet in the deep than you do in close. And um, so I put that through the eye of the fish, of the pilchard. The pilchard hangs down here. Then I'll just get a strip of mullet. I cut it about that size, two finger wide. And through the, width, the depth of the fillet. Okay, so you get around about six pieces at the front. And then the tail part, I split that down the centre, it's about that long. So I get around about seven or eight pieces out of a, a fillet of mullet, so even a big mullet. Um, and then um, I hang the squid will go through twice, or, or the pilchard, I mean the mullet fillet will go through the top part and then just through the next part. Always the median, I'll leave the flat, the skinny part at the bottom. Because I believe they're going to try and eat that fat bit that's up on the hook. And, um, and I believe that when the fish bite it, they, well, it's always a like, boom, bang, that seems to be the scenario. So that, that pilch is just going to dissolve and hopefully his mates will come in on that. Um, and then they'll eat the mullet next, right, or the squid. Um, when you hook up your deep water fish, even pearlies, you, they obviously try and, I'm uh, getting pro sort of this, but they try and uh, exhale how, uh, whatever they've eaten, obviously, because they're hooked. Um, and that uh, vomit they spit out attracts his mates so it's best to leave one fish on unless it's a monster and you want to get it up take, take the thing and don't touch the button <laughs> and watch the rod bounce like this and uh, and wait for the second one to load on because it's a long way up okay the other thing it says the fish out there is, is long is the time it takes you around about uh, in say in 200 meters it's about 25 minutes by the time you bait up drop down hook the fish straight away and come back up, okay? In about 500 minutes, it's about 40 minutes plus. So by the time you get to the bottom, it takes about six minutes to get to the bottom out there. In, in 250 meters, it takes about three minutes. Um, and then you'll get a fish straight away and then it's around about 20 minutes or 40 minutes to come up depending on how deep you are. You can't go too fast. If you go too fast, so these reels are all powerful. Um, 
you will, um, especially pearlies, if you close, they'll, they'll pop off. And when the fish pop off, they talk. Okay, they really do talk. So you lose one fish, not too bad. You lose two fish in the same spot. I, I bet my nuts, they, they hardly bite again. They just know, they know. I don't know what they know, but they know something I don't. <laughs> but they definitely do talk. And we have to go to the next position. Okay? And that's when we find our next new spot because we've got time to go to the round again uh, and find a new spot. So pearlies are really big time for that. Okay? I think any fish that has like that, um, Dewey is the same too. You've got that white uh, airbag inside of them. They seem to be able to talk to each other for some reason, I, I believe. More than, say, a snapper or something like that. You drop a couple of snappers, they keep biting. You drop pearlies or dewies or cod, they seem to talk to each other because they've got that sack inside them. Um, so, um, yeah, so get that second fish on, letting spew out, and the next one jumps on, you load it up twice, you, you're coming up. So, um, before we go any further, I might just show you what I mean by that. And Liam will show you here. So this is the other day, it's on Monday, we just took a little bit of footage out here, right? So, we went and got a few pearlies first, and then we dropped a few pearlies. We'd already bagged out, but that's when we realised we had a few too many. So, we were actually throwing them in the live well, around 45 centimetres, and upgrading it to 55s or 50s. Uh, then let the other boys go. And some of us were just throwing, they were 45, just throwing back in the water. Um, so, typical day for me, I'll out wide, leave in the, in the sunrise and come back in the sunset. Um, so we'll leave it in the sunrise. And it's about to push the little play button down the bottom there. Okay. So, well, I was using a Force Master, and we're using a Beast Master as well. Um, and just the same was as this. Oh, I was, this is on the pearly ground. So, when I'm fishing my live, on um, my deep drop rod, I jig at the same time. Just to have what I got, because I like times the essence. <laughs> Try and do as much as I can. Um, and sometimes, obviously, two fish come up all the time. So, you see the bite just then? See the tip? That's the tip. You see I let a bit more line out, you watch it'll bite straight away, it'll chew it I think. <laughs> let that bit of slack out again. See that? Straight away. If it was just tight, you don't get that bite rarely, but as soon as you let a line out, it's straight away. With the electrics, don't, as I said, don't pull up too fast. The most, uh, yeah, okay, thank you, cheers. Can you stay okay in the back lot, there guys? Yeah. That's a Force Master 9000. Yeah. Um, you know, we use both Force and Beast. The difference between the two, those two reels is that just the motor on the Beast Master is a lot of brushless motor, so it never heats up. It just has power all the time. Um, but the Force Master, I've never stalled one yet. And with most electrics, especially these ones, the more, to give it more power, you don't push the throttle up, it's going to make it faster. To give it more power, you tighten the drag Because it all works on the drag slipping. If the drag starts slipping and you're not fresh on, it'll drop back the power to allow for the arm. Um, I'll just watch this part of the shape. I drop. So this is the first fish I dropped. I'll pull this through on back. I think I'll pull this one. Oh, that's just a little. So that's about as small as we got that day. That one's about probably 45. It looks about 30, but it's about 45. <laughs> that one's going over to the live well. So these are a bit bigger models. These are the ones that talk. So this is about half an hour later. The sun's come up a bit. And they're probably around about 55 centimetres each, or 60 maybe. You see it swim off there? So, the next drift we did, um, we got a couple of fish, then we dropped another one, and then we never got another fish. <laughs> so we had to move on to the next one. Oh, actually we didn't, because we bagged out the time. We got time. And that's that too. So it's a bit deeper now. We've already bagged out. Um, so flame snappers and um, the three nine sharks, three nine sharks are pain now, so he was so many. Uh, not bad eating, but if you have to do you're going to catch. They're better than eating the soap and bacon, but they're not the best. But they fight similar, so you don't really get a flame snapper on or a very nice shark, it's always in that same depth. 
We're only using 80 pound um, braid, that's enough for out here guys. So I've got my big knee, I've got 130 on it. Um, but I think it's an overkill. I've never broken off 80 pound, ever. But I get a thousand meters on a little reel. So it's plenty of line, but I bust off and pop that day, I've still got that kick this thing without having to come home, you know. How deep are you here, baby? Uh, here we're in 280 meters for 300. Yeah, 80 pound line. 80 pound line, that's all you use there. Uh, I've used the 150 pound line on, and um, the same rig as you got here. Oh, it's smaller as well, it's got a small bit. Yeah. Full size, mate. Looks red. Yeah. Oh, so this is what I've got. I've got a few flamies, this one, I think. We've got a few flamies the other day as well. This is sort of the average size around that 4 kilo size. They're beautiful fish. And there's heaps of them out here, guys. There's heaps. Like every, every time we go fishing, we find a new ground for playing. So. so just watch the tip. You'll see how the tip is there. So I've got one fish on there, right? Second fish on now. See that? See how it went loose? I've never, I only experienced this maybe once or twice before. But where it goes loose, I think, okay, the bust of me off or the fit me off or something's gone wrong. But in this case, it's not the case. You'll see it load up straight away. They swam up with two kilos of lead. <laughs> so they swam up at the bottom with my, with my sinker hanging at their head. Um, so that's how strong they are. So this particular one here, um, this is the first drop. You'll see the other rod's the same scenario on the other side of the boat too. Um, so we both got um, double hookups of like 10 kilo pods. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, that's right. That's what I'm saying. It's just know your distance. Know how much better you got to get back in to get that next safe area, isn't it? Is that the hell Yes, it is. Yes. So good. No, so um, he's using a, a 250 Yammy and it, when you put it, turn it on, it just drops the motor straight down real low. And it just holds you there. When you obviously move again, you've got to um, tilt the motor back out. But if you got um, if you got inboards in your boat like the, um, the um, pod drives, they'll, they'll do the same sort of scenario. Uh, this running off the main battery, um, those little reels they, they draw up to about twenty amps an hour, but you can run it all day. I take up my little battery on a friend's boat, so it's a little fifty amp. Um, um, the ones that uh, the dry cell type ones are in the fridge. Um, little 50 amp one and it runs all. Sorry, man. Not a lithium, no, it's not a lithium. It's just a, yeah, I think it's one of those, yeah. Yeah, and they're pretty good. It's like self sealed rollover, doesn't hurt, whatever. Um, I can get all day of it and still, oh, it'll be ready to go the next day and do two days out of it. They don't draw, you only use them 20 amps, max draw, full power, you know, per hour, so. Oh, that's that drop, so that's quite around 10 kilo each, 8 or 12 kilo each. Flamey. Hey, what's that light thing you use? Uh, that's actually his gut. So no, the flame. Oh, the light. Oh, which is it? Oh, the light's on the snap. You got, I think you got one in your bags there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the lights I use are only over about 150 metres. I don't use them in 100 metres at all. For the, for the, you can turn back on things now. Do you want to watch anything else at all? <laughs> Probably a bit not as boring as me. Uh, I'll turn it on. Thanks to you for the moment. Cheers, mate. Awesome, my So, um,. It's, I was going to stop it and go along, but I'll talk about it now. So any questions you can ask me. It's just sort of like the rough sort of stuff we do when we're out there. Um, but as I told you before, try and load up that second fish. So you saw how it works. It's like one on there, and then the second one jumped on. And just, you can see the difference in the rod straight away, right? These rods that we're using are, are quite um, soft. That's our, one of the biggest selling rods. Um, well, there's two rods actually, that one and the status but um, they're quite soft on the tip. So my original rod, my X9, is like a bloody, I could, I could, I could lift a 20 kilo weight and you wouldn't see it bend. It's <laughs> off the floor. It's quite stiff, it's too stiff. Um, these days we're using quite, it's quite a soft tip rod, okay? And even pearly, you see every little bite, you see every little thing, even a little ornate snapper, which you get a lot out there, only about this big, maybe a kilo max. Those things make the rod bounce all over the joint, you know? So you want a fairly soft tip rod, but they're capable of, of taking 120 pound line. They're very thick balled, uh, but, but light on the tip. Um, you have to use really a bent butt out of the rod holder. 
I had a, a Tanacom which I used for many years before I went up to these ones. Um, the Tanacom um, I used on a straight butt out of my rod holder, so it sat a bit high angle like that. Um, it was a bit dangerous when you dropped the sinker down because it sort of nearly popped it right out of the rod holders. It, it was too out of control. Um, so the bent butt keeps it more flat and tends to be a lot better to use. Make sure you get a safety line on your reels. Hook it on the back here, hook it on to, to wherever. Um, one time we were out there at uh, Riviera Grounds and my, one of my mate's cat, 26 foot cat, and he's got a pod between the motors. He walked at this at the rail and he's got two rod holders on the rail. And I said, are they good quality? He said, you use the middle of the three reels that he said, you can use over those if you want. And I said, oh, I don't know how good they are. And he goes, oh, they're strong. So I lucky, I, for some reason, I tightened my Shimano safety strap, which is about four metres long to about a metre and a half uh, on, off the rails. Went back and around like this and kept it short. So I could still lift it up. I had to run a rod. And um, anyhow, so I hit the bottom, I uh, hooked up like, I think a massive blue eye about 30 kilos or 20 kilos and the rod just went tung, it snapped the holder and I went down on the water like that and the water's about here my reels nearly in the water like that <laughs> and to try and pull that back up and get it into a roll hole of a comey yeah, it, it was hard with the fish hanging off the end of it how do you set the drag on electric reels so you set the drag um, this is a good question Wayne so you set the drag depending on the fish you're catching so um, if you go too tight, I said, because they're so powerful, they'll just rip it out of the mouth. And if you come too fast, you'll rip it out of the mouth, definitely. So, as I was getting to before, the power works off the drag. So, the reel knows that's the setting there, and the lines pulls up quite easy. That's only the, the amount of power it's going to give you to pull that fish up, because it needs to allow it to slip if you want it to slip. If you're fishing out in uh, 500 metres and you're catching two 20 or 30 kilo fish, you just crank it right up, and now it's but these things got like 30 something, they're like, like 80, 80 or 130 real drags on them. It's just ridiculous. I can't even pull that out. And it's super smooth. I think they're 28 kilos. Or, oh no, sorry, 38 kilos or 40 kilos. It's ridiculous. It's in there. Yeah, look, we see what the drag says on that book one. Um, but, uh, so you just crank it up and it's going to give all the power to that drag to winch them straight up. That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. So I've had guys come in and, and I tell them, but I don't know if they forget, I don't know, but... You know, they say all oh, the reels doesn't work, it slips and does nothing, no power. And I said, Do you crank the drag up? They go, No, I didn't. I said, Well, crank the drag up, and, and it's, it's instant power. Because that's how the, the, the brain thing works inside of them. So that's the Beastmaster combo. This is a Force Master combo. Um, oh, sorry, this one's not. This one that's the place. That's a Force Master. So both these will do all the work you want it to do. I rarely use my big meter these days. Um, if I go over 500 metres, I might take it out. But I, I catch all the blue eye and, and cod and that stuff I want on, on that outfit, you know, or that outfit. Um, the, the Force Master and Beast Master are about $500 difference in price. Um, and then you go down to, and they're both those hold 1,000 metres of 80 or about seven, 750 of 100. Um, then you go down to, uh, the plays, which is probably one of the biggest sellers because most guys don't fish over 300 meters, they sort of stop at about 300 or 350. The plays has all the power to pull up again to 20 kilo cod like those before, or 10 kilo cod, um, and it holds 600 meters of 80, so it holds enough to fish up to about 400 meters deep. What's the price uh, they're about a K, so the combos are at about spilled up about around 1290, something like that, with the rod. So can you fish yeah. with gyms with a Force Master or a Beast Master? 100%. That's all we fish. So um, I had, I've got a, some Chinese gentlemen I fish with a lot. They're good mates of mine for the last eight years. And they, they're obviously, the Asians are really into electric fishing. Yeah. They taught me a lot about electrics. <laughs> they had their own reels they brought over. And then uh, I had my Mia because I've got my Mia, my wife's Japanese over, you know. So I bought that in about 98 when I was in Japan before I even started selling in, in our shop. And, um, and I think we were the first ones to start doing them in Australia for Solus back in the early 2000s. And I was bringing them from Japan over and, and on selling them. And um, I had my big big nine, and these guys going with their little, whatever reels they were, brand, Shimano or Daiwa, not the Tenacon, so a bit better than Tenacon. And, um, and they were pulling up the same fish as I was on my big reel, side by side, and they're quicker. These little things are so quick, yeah. if you want to go quick, that is. 
Um, and if you don't, if you miss a fish, you need to pull up just a sinker. They're like sitting around having the sandwich, but one's still coming up on the mirror. They're so fast. Anyhow, so um, I realised yeah, I don't need that big reel so much, and it's so cumbersome and heavy and whatever. And they break. They tend to be a bit hard on um, combing rod holders, <laughs> the big ones, because your rod's so big and chunky. I used to use an eighty-pound chair rod out of the combing. Yeah. So the biggest fish we've hooked out here um, is a. Uh, well, I always not when I'm fishing around 400 meters deep, I normally have or 350. I put a um, it's like a rigged up uh, big lumo squid with a lighter on everything, and I try and always hoping one day to get a swordfish. Okay, that's my dream out here, besides the um, ruby snapper and the cut ponds. <laughs> there he is. Um, anyhow, I um, I rig up the top of the snap, so I have my light on the snap, I have my rig on the snap, which is going to sit here. I run a, um, a big snap that's around sort of 150 kilos, 200 kilo, so it's sort of seven or eight. And um, I, just a good little idea too guys, is what we just put, tie a bit of Dacron onto the safety area and this hook your snap on there, it's just nice and neat and easy, rather than hooking onto your guides because it tends to scratch your guides and you get corrosion problems. So we'll put down there, it's done all right, so okay. Um, if your reel's got that, that application. So in here, I'll put the light on there, I'll put my, my end of my rig on there, and I'll put, uh, out there I'll put a, um, uh, a small, not a small, but two like 11, 12 circles uh, with a squid rigged up on it, on a big lumo squid over the squid, okay? Um, hope you get that thing, uh, that uh, swordfish. And that one time right there, uh, you at Liam was with me actually. Yeah, when, yeah, and uh, Around right about 320 metres, and um, the rod, uh, we'll catch him, obviously, cod, and the rod went like that, and then it loaded up, and then it went off again. And I thought, oh my god, here we go. And then it loaded up again, <laughs> and it's really loaded up. And then my mate, um, I said, I think I said, hit the, hit the button. My mate, Greg, he um, had two big cod on, around 20 kilos each at the same time, and our lines crossed, and we just started to pull it up with the weight on it. And then um, it went loose, and I thought, you bastard, he's cut me off. Because if lines touch each other under pressure, they, one's going to cut, one, you're going to lose one. The, the, the braid does that, as you probably know. I thought, shit. So I said to Liam, just push, push the button one, I went, and I spill now. <laughs> so Liam's like, Ehh. it's coming up pretty fast. And then um, at about 120 metres from the top, um, the rod in, was in the combing, like that, that, like that. And then this swung around like that to, to that way. And we look at the distance and here's this thing thrashing on the surface. We go, oh my God. Get, get the flyer, rip open the back door, get ready <laughs> and bring it on board. So we, we were getting all excited and high five each other. And the rods, because it's electric, you just let it do its own thing. You know, it's playing the fish. And um, it's too big a rod. It's not an 80 pound chair. It's too big to hang on in your hand. So um, it went deep. And then it played it. And I think it made about 40 minutes later. We got to see a big white thing in the, in the water and we thought this is it, this is a big swordfish and we just, because everyone gets a little swordfish out here, no one gets like a 120 or 200 kilo one in and um, we thought this is it, so I'm thinking of all the things on Facebook and whatever and um, anyhow, went down again and we got we got the flying gap, we got everything ready to, to nail this fish and um, and then it, it just stopped fighting and at about 20 metres down and um, I thought, oh, that's must have died or something, so we just put electric on, cranked the drag up and just like winched it up. And it was a bloody blue marlin feeding on the bottom. <laughs> Serious. It was a blue marlin about 120, 140 kilos. And, um, and it was um, feeding on the bottom. I could not believe that. So there you go. Still waiting to get that swordfish. Have you talked about different fish you've caught? And we all know the eating qualities of um, flame. Mm. Flame tail and uh, pearlies and blue eyes develop. Mm. But what are, what, what are bar cod like and what other fish are you, you going to catch that you don't want? Okay. Um, bar cod are even more wider than the blue eye, I believe. We had something with you last night. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. Oh, you mentioned green eyes too. Are they? I'll call okay. them with the okay. Birds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the bar cod are. Um, um, so all your deep water fish guys, not, not pearlies though, right? Okay. Talking like. 200 meter plus, you have to fillet them. Or you can leave them on SKI ice for two days, but best to fillet them because they've got a lot of slime on them. 
So you fill them and you skin them and you cut them into chunks and then you put them into some big tray in your fridge if your wife lets you or your missus <laughs> <laughs> and cover it so the smell doesn't go bad. It doesn't smell anything. And it will like leach out this fluid out of its spot, out of its meat. And that fluid will all of a sudden be like it's, like it's in water in the tray, so it's come out of the meat. And that's the secret to get that out. It, the first time I ever caught um, a blue eye and, and cod many years ago, I um, was so excited to try it because I always had it at restaurants, expensive and nice, tastes nice. So I filled it, thrown it on, on the, uh, I think I cooked some barbie actually, I don't remember, big thick white meat, and uh, it went to like, shrunk to like rubber. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? And, it was, and the barbecue was like just water all the time. And that's what happens, it boils itself and just goes terrible. So you have to get that fluid out, it's really important. When you get the fluid out, it's, it's unbelievable. And that's what, the, what they do at the restaurants too, the same scenario. What sort of time frame is that? Two days, two to three days, even three days is better. A lot of guys tell me you should leave my knives for two days and then fill them and then leave another day. <laughs> and then, then eat them after that. So this is why, because it's so deep, I don't know if it's to do with their flesh compound or what it is, but it, it definitely uh, is a better scenario. Is there some sort of strainer or something like that? Um, I, uh, yeah, so you've got to keep tipping the fluid out, I think. I tip the fluid out, check it sort of twice a day and tip it out. Yeah, so it's amazing where it comes from, but it's in the flesh. But when you cook it, it cooks like normal fish. And it's so flaky and so beautiful texture. Okay? Yeah. I, I, what we're going to do this Christmas, we're actually going to do a recipe. I'm going to sell it, I'm going to give it to you guys. So everyone that's been to the seminars, we're going to do up a recipe thing and send out to you. And um, please try some of our recipes because they're so nice. Yeah. On all different species. What about freezing? Uh, freezing, yes. So cry back it. So if you don't have a cry back Australian machine, wine. no. Oh, if you do, okay. This is a good question. Um, guys have told me that if you freeze it straight away, you need to do the same process when you defrost it for two days. Okay. The most fish, if you've got a cold fridge, like, you know, stand around five degrees or eight degrees, whatever, will, a fish will last about seven days or six days before it starts to get a little bit of smell or a little bit of change of colour. So just keep it well wrapped, no air gets to it, and, uh, and let it sit. <coughs> and if you want to cry back it on the fourth day, then go for it. I'd probably rather do that than cry back it straight away. Okay. Do you put salt in the rice when you're sort of uh, in the, when you're resting them? Do yes. Salt. Uh, okay. Yeah, on, on the ice, yes, I do. So we do always do a brine up of salt water and ice. Um, if you got the ice, if you got the bags, like the other day we just had a hundred litre esky, and that filled up with pearl perch actually, <laughs> and one small cod. Um, so we had a one of the really big bags of one point five or two meter. Um, zip bag and it was like a big sausage with fish in it so um, we have sort of three bags of ice on both in both areas the esky we put water into that one the other one bag we don't the bags are if you guys got bags the bags are really cold when you open night the cold air actually comes out you feel it where, where the esky you don't feel it you know it's quite amazing yeah a good bag that is uh, we sell the bags too, but they're, they're good, they're good, and they're easy because they're out of the way, so if you can fold it up when you need it, you bring it out. But you need to keep your ice somewhere in, if you're going to use it. Right? Um, so with the fish, Wayne, getting back to what you're saying, um, the common species over, th over say, 300 metres are going to be um, a bar cod, and then your blue eyes a bit deeper, and your bass groper. The bass groper are a little bit different to... Um, the bar cod, the bar cod tend to have those little white edges on their fins and put on the bars on their body. The bar, uh, bass groper are a bit more chunkier, smaller eyes. The eyes don't always pop out of their head like they do with the bar cod. Um, they're more like a, a groper actually, like a groper type. The groper's different to cod, the cod's a bit longer, bigger dip in their tail. Um, the groper's quite chunky all the way through, okay, and small, smaller eyes. Um, and harp look ready too. So I see um, um, a couple of the guys, I can't remember his name, up in Brisbane. I think Peter Flawless got some too, but they're catching harp hooker out of half out Morton in about three to 400 metres. I have no doubt they'll be out here as well. I just haven't got one yet. Yeah. So the same as they catch in NZ or down south. Um, and then the other species we get, um, we get like an orange sea perch, like an orange roughy. They only grow to about two kilos, like, like a scorpion cod 
but not as bad as a scorpion cod if you get pricked or something. Um, they are really nice meat. The meats are extremely white and really nice steamed. If you want to steam it, which is sweet and sour, whatever, they're very nice. Um, we get obviously gemfish. Um, we get um, um, what are they called? Um, tilefish. So has anyone caught a tilefish out here yet? So yeah, tilefish are, are they're like a cross between a parrotfish and a wrasse. It's got a long tail like a wrasse, but a head like a parrotfish sort of thing. Um, the average size is around 50 to 60 centimetres, but they grow massive. But overseas they're huge things actually, but I haven't got a big one out yet. The biggest I call is probably about 60 centimetres, maybe three and a half kilo, four kilo. They're quite chunky. Um, they're really white flesh as well. Do you try eels, mate? Oh, they're unbelievable, eh? So the, when, you, when you, you might have seen this, when you fill them, the flesh then wraps around your hand. It's so soft, so nice. All, all deep water fish are so nice. I think down the bottom is probably only about 10 degrees, so the water's very cold and the, the flesh is very nice. Um, it's like bringing kings up. Yeah, the, the water the kings is better than That's it. right. So, getting a good, we bought that before with the kings and snapper, you get a lot of kings in about two, 220 to 280 metres, and they're totally different to the kings you get in the 50s. Their meat's very oily, they're really nice sashimi, like you would not believe. The best sashimi. So, the butt belly areas is full of fat, um, and they're really nice to eat. Yeah, so. If you get any deep water kingies, make sure you eat them. Has anyone fished down off tweed heads? Oh, actually, guys, well, not many guys have been down off tweed heads. But down off tweed heads, you've got the marks there, I think, on the marks. So I'll run through those in a moment. But there's an area down there in about two, 200, 220 metres. And um, it's, uh, it's a big ridge. Some of us say it's the, the east side of Mount Warning land at the ocean when Mount Warning blew up, I don't know. But it is a, a prominent uh, ridge that runs for about five k's. And um, the kingies down there, this time of year, just off the Richter scale. Like the average around about sort of six to fifteen kilos, and unfortunately the bag limit's not many kings anyway. Like two, you've got to come back into Queensland water, so <laughs> you can't keep many, you know. But you'll get your if you get three guys, you get six kings in the first drift. They're just heaps up and down there. Yeah, snap up. They're real, they're deep water ones too. Okay, um, other fish you catch out there. Uh, your tile fish. Um, we caught a, a new species the other day out in three fifty meters. We've got the big flaming, and that was called a. Um, it was a snapper, snapper was the first word, second word was um, Frank, I think. It was an orange, it's like a, a yellow mango jack. Did anyone ever caught one of those out here? Prank snapper, I think it's called, or snapper prank, something like that. It's like, looks like, looks like a mango jack, but it's yellow. And it was about probably three and a half, four kilos. And um, my mate said it was really nice eating as well. Really good. Flamey's very nice, like a big rosy jobfish. They call it rosy jobfish and eating rosy jobfish. They're like that, but a bigger scale. And I think the um, the uh, um, ruby snapper are the same sort of scenario. Ruby snapper is a big, bigger version of a flame snapper, so they get more chunkier. Um, a bit like a bit like a green jobfish, but in red colour. So more chunky and fox head and, uh, and a little bit different. So they're out there too. Um, then we get the old green eye shark. So the green eye shark, standby. So they're not biting on the day. <laughs> and you want to catch green eye sharks. Now this is a really tricky law, this one, because maybe you guys online can help us out here, but I don't know, like in America, they're classed as not a shark. They're called dogfish in, in America, okay? Goddamn got dogfish, I say. Um, Robert Canada once um, fishing for the halibut and they just drove us crazy and they hated them because they called them dogfish. Uh, but same species, the most prolific species of shark in the world is, is green eye shark. There are trillions of them out there. They're like locusts at the bottom in the deep. They're like the, if you know, if you guys have fished out the 50s before and had the leather jackets come in and bite your gear all up, they're like that version in the deeper water. Okay? So there's just trillions of them. But I don't know if they're a shark or if they're actually a fish because they have a hard bone on them, right? Sharks mean they have no bone. That's why they call them a fish because they're two spikes that are out there dorsal and their back dorsal, uh, solid bone, okay? And they try to impale that into you. And I have had customers get done on their forearms because they spin around, they you grab the wrong position, but we'll fit you in this area here. With are their they back one. Uh, some people say they are, I'm not quite sure. Uh, those guys, I like think. Paul Jackson's got yeah, that spike. That's yeah, that's right, they have got that similar but I don't spike. know, it's poisonous. Right? Yeah, well, I don't know, but they, they really do open up though and um, so what you do when you get them you got to lean their head against the gunnel of the boat 
Now, if you want to cut the hook off, you can do that, but I'll give my hook back. And you have to grab them on the gill section. And grab hard and don't let him try and get out of you. He can't get to you in that position. If you grab down a bit further, he'll get you with his either prong. Mm. And you grab any higher, it'll bite your finger. So <laughs> you've got to grab him on the gill section from the behind and hold it really tight and get the hook out. The hook will come out pretty easy. So we'll, um, but if you want to keep them to eat, they have an array of sizes. Um, the little ones seem to be closer, the big ones out wider. Um, we put them maybe that small, the smallest, but we put them also around probably three or four kilos. Um, if you've ever eaten shark, like those of you from Melbourne perhaps, a flake, um, these things make, uh, say, uh, what's, it, what's the shark down there? Gummy. That, yeah, gummy shark, yeah. They make gummy shark look like um, eating sweet to pearl perch. They're very, very nice. The meat's very white. Um, and you just, um, has anyone eaten very nice shark here yet? Is everyone throwing them back? Yeah. yeah. Try one. Cut the hook. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm, I always used to give my egg because they're really good eating, mate. Like, take someone out, you get the very nice sharks, buddy. And um, hopefully they're from Melbourne area. <laughs> they like them more. Um, but um, if then they've always said they're so nice to eat. So I tried some one time and they, they are really nice to eat. They've eaten them lots of times. Eh? Not meaning we didn't catch anything else, but <laughs> just meaning that we just ate them as a, as a shark. It's stronger taste, but really nice. And very white, as I said. Okay. Um, are you bleeding them at all? No, nah, we're not bleeding sharks. We bleed, um, we actually don't bleed anything except for um, Kings, Amberjack and Samson. Um, we do spike them though. We spike a lot of our fish with the icky spike. So that's sort of, uh, I think it makes up for a lot of that time when you bleed fish. Yeah, um, the cod's too hard to cut. You would need uh, like a hacksaw nearly. Yeah, the wings of the cod are very nice though. If you get the cod and they eat the wing part, which is around the neck, um, that area is really good. Like a lot of you probably try to cut the wings. Do you, do you understand? There's like a little portion you can slide the knife in that just cuts in around the wings, which is up near where they join them to the head at the top. So there's always a little, a little uh, scalloped area. A little hard piece, and you just slide the knife under that and up, and it'll just go straight through. If you try and cut it like this, you'll end up wrecking your knife. Okay. Are you fighting the cod? Ah, uh, we are sometimes the smaller ones, one hundred percent. The bigger ones, no, no. Um, as long as it, oh, you got a good eye, sorry. I, I think I believe because I don't because it's got so much slime, and it's like a different scenario. It's a, like that embalms them in there own little world until you fill the fish. So you don't towel them or anything? No, I just put them straight in ice, sorry. I've got a, I'm like an Eskimo as big as this table, but it's a fairly decent size. I'm old Haynes, I used to take a big blue one. Yeah. I think it's 280 litres, so just shove them in there. In like six bags of ice. Yeah, and about, uh, it's normally like half a bucket or a bucket of salt water to one bag of ice. So it becomes not much ice, but a lot of really, really cold water. If you put your hands in, it's like, yeah, it's freezing. <laughs> yeah, so just do that. Um, but uh, the flame snapper we spike, any like snapper type thing we spike always. Yeah. You can cut the throat on those too if you want. That's up to you guys. Is there anything we shouldn't be eating out there? Um, Besides whales? Uh, <laughs> and dolphins, by the way. Dolphins. <laughs> um, so, no, the, uh, everything is edible. Yep, as far as I know. What about the oil fish? Okay, except for that, except for that. Okay, the oil fish, did you catch them? I've never caught one any, but they are out there. Um, there's another species too, I can't remember what it is. I don't know, I've been on a friend's boat yeah. out there, seen out there, we caught and oil fish did one you? after the other. Yeah, did you really, yeah. And the blokes I was with were eating so, them and I read up on it and thought, yeah, yeah. no thanks. No, that's right, that's right. There was a lot of sailor stories but about those. Some things. people eat them though. Yeah, that's right, they do. The, the oil fish is, um, it's like eating a couple of packets of laxettes. So, supposedly, <laughs> it just runs out, you can't control it. So, so if you've got a mate that's on the boat tonight, give me the shits, literally. Not your butt, fish buddy. But, uh, so they look like, like, a, like a barracuda, right? Or like a, um, a gem fish, sort of thing. Yeah, but dark fish, coloured. Yeah, dark yeah coloured so, fish, yeah. Um, dark coloured gem fish. So if you get a dark coloured gem fish that looks like a gem fish, it may, it may be an old fish, that's your mates. <laughs> okay. But some um, people eat with no... I mean, Casper. Yes, hey, Casper, yeah. he, he eats them all the time. He's does like, he really? Oh, he's he a does. unit. He was, I was with him when he caught some. <laughs> yeah. And he says he eats them no problem at all. He's trying to tell me to eat them, but I thought, I don't think so. 
Yeah, let him go first. <laughs> the one fish out here that's probably one of the nicest fish to catch, a beautiful looking fish. I put it on off Twitter, I haven't put him up here yet. Um, I call Ray's brim or the or the um, pomfret fish. They're like a like a purpley they change colours, they go black at the end, but they're like a purpley silver fish. Um, this is a beautiful fish. And uh, um, the one I got was about probably two and a half, three kilos. Got them about 420 metres deep down a tweed. And um, I only got the one. I would like to got more. Um, but they are like, Shannon works here, he used to be a pro longliner. And if they caught one of those on the long line, like, you know, he'd, he'd swap that for, he'd give you like a 50 kilo tuna if you had one of those <laughs> on the line. That's what he said the taste is so, it's unbelievable. So I did eat mine and it was very, very, very nice. Yeah. So that's called a braised brim. Um, that's, so there are a lot of species out there, there's a lot, there's probably about 20, 20 species of fish you're going to catch. Um, but you guys need to know how to find the fish, this is the important part of the, of the seminar. So um, the apps that are available are on your phone is Navionics and Garmin do Sea Captain, is it? Captain something? Oh, I should ask. Active, Active, Active Captain. Active Captain, I should ask Mike, yeah. Active Captain. And um, it, very good. Very good um, definition on the bottom. It's like looking at, at it on the TV on the bottom. Um, and uh, then there's another one which is called Bati Map. So Bati Maps is one which I talked to guys about last time. is a really good app. It's um, it shows more definition than Navionics app. What is it called? Bati Maps. B A T H Y M A P S. It's about eighty bucks a year, um, but you can only use it as a as a searching source and not a GPS. Where Navion uses a GPS app. So the Bathy Maps is um, you go looking. So at night time, my wife's always up with me for the rent. She's, what are you doing? I'm looking at that map again. But I'm just like, click, 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 click. You just zoom in. I'll, I've marked so many marks of it. I've got to try. Um, it's, it's like little holes everywhere, little rises everywhere when you zoom in. And and I've pretty well mapped out from um, oh, about half out North Strati down to about off the seaway in 200 to 500 metres now. <laughs> went down. Um, I don't know how many marks I got on there. But um, it puts marks on there and it'll hold those marks. You can just go straight to that point and, um, and see where it is. And then transfer that. You have to transfer the data across to your GPS by hand though. I don't know how to, how to transfer it um, with a chip or something or card. So it doesn't work that way. So, um, but it's extremely good tool to find the spots. Yeah, usually the lap minus. Yeah. Uh, so they have they give you three different types of lap and longs. That's a bit confusing, um, and one is way different to what everything else is. But that's a northern hemisphere correction, I think, or something like that. I, it's very different. I can't work it out quite yet. And I tried to do search and trying to work out what it is. Has anyone ever? Has anyone else got bathy maps here at all? B A T H Y M A P S, Bathy Maps. There is a full for it. Yeah, there is. I haven't had time to read it yet, but yeah, there is. Yeah, I probably should do that. I've already spent like hours on it. Days. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at it, you'll see how good it is. Uh, also, how many people use Navionics in their phone? Okay, most of you should, and it transfers across the iPad as well when you're out, out there. Um, it, uh, Navionics doesn't work on data; it works on satellite. So. You don't have, if you've got no data coverage, it still works 100%, okay? If you'd be a thousand miles out, it still works. Um, the thing is, it chews up your battery, so you need to have a, a, a cigarette adapter with your iPad uh, connection in it to keep it charged up, otherwise it'll draw your battery real quick, especially on your phone. So if you dial emergency, you've got no battery left, but you've got your GPS marks, but you've got no, no safety, <laughs> safety line. But um, it's, um, I've learned from it, the, you have now in the Navionics boating, you have two categories of your shading down the bottom. If you go to map options and then look at it, you've got sonar chart or standard chart, always click on sonar chart, which is the first two options it gives you. Then you have sonar shading and I don't know what the next one's called, but relief. relief shading, is it? Yeah, relief shading. So the sonar shading in our area off the coast here, so from Tweed up to about jumping pin only goes out to 100 metres, but it's in full detail, okay? Pretty good detail. You'll see every little little dent, you'll see every little ridge, you'll see the little rocks, you see everything on the bottom. 
and it is pretty well 99% accurate. You go to the, you mark that spot, you go there, the sound comes up like that, okay? Um, when you go further north, when you go up North Australia, which we do a lot of fishing up that area as well, it'll actually, because the way our contours are on, on the coastline here, it'll extend out to about 210 metres. Uh, unfortunately, everything is on the other side of that, it's in about 240 to 280 or 300. So you need to go to the relief shading and switch it. And then that then, all of a sudden, what was on that side becomes on that side. But the relief shading has colour shading to, to depending on the depth. Okay? And in full detail again, so remember that. So you go from that to that. That app's about 37 bucks a year. You'd save that on the first day of fishing in field by going directly to your spot rather than trying to find a spot. Okay? So definitely worth getting, 100%. Not a condition from those guys, but <laughs> but I definitely recommend it. It's my Bible. I got about uh, well, I've, unfortunately, I used my marks up many many years ago. So I got a thousand marks. So oil. I'm still trying to work out how I can load more marks onto it, but I can't. Um, I try to purchase more marks, but it doesn't seem to work. So um, thousand marks is all you can have on there. So when you run out of marks, now I've got about a thousand photos on there. So uh, with that with that app, um, because I can't put any icons on the screen anymore. I just take a photo of the fish or take a photo of the day and it keeps all the lap long for me and stores the photo onto the map. So I just click on the photo, I can see what it was that day and I know exactly, it tells me the time and the date and everything. So you then can store, I don't have any photos, I can store probably a thousand I reckon, but so I'm up to 2,000 now. So <laughs> I, I, I dread the day I lose my phone. I should put it onto iPad and, um, and upset, upload it um, or on my computer. but. Um, the other thing it does is it records your, your whole track for the day and you can and then save that track. So you can go back and you know exactly how your drift was in that day. And as I say to my customers all the time, please put so many icons on your screen that you run out of the icons. It's so important. Because you know on that particular day the wind was blowing from the northwest, right? And you drift, you start your drift there, you have your start icon and you know your bottom, that's as far as you go, you're going to waste your time after that. So you mark your bottom icon, and any bites in between, you mark them too. Right? So you know you start long. The next time you go out, it might be blowing northeast, and think, okay, that one's, that drift's not going to work, but you know it's there. You then mark your northeast drift. So when you get that next time again, and it's blowing northeast, you know exactly where to start your point. Okay? But before you do that, you need to know what the current's doing. So you need to work out your drift. And if the day, that day you're on, if you've saved your track, it'll tell you how fast you're drifting, 1.2, 1.6, 1.2. So, and you know which way the wind is blowing that day because you see your track going that, that way. So everything relates to the day you're out there. So if you do that first little bit of drift while we're getting your gear ready, cutting your bait up, getting everything ready to drop, and you drift it for 10 minutes or five minutes, you look up your plotter, make sure your plotter is zoomed into around 300 metres, obviously, unless it's really ripping. And um, you'll know exactly that last line on your plotted plot trail to your next, that same drift, and you just nail the fish straight away because you know to go exactly to that spot. You drifted this similar speed, that's where I'm going to start at that icon, and I'm going to drift down to that icon. Okay? Problem is, as we all know, especially when it's variable, the next drift you're going to go that way because the wind swung a little bit um, but you've already got your plotted marks from that time and find the wind drift going that way so you just don't miss if you've got nothing and then just one mark that's the spot where i'm going to go to it's useless because you don't know you drift you don't know the speed you're drifting it's it's very hard to comprehend unless you've done a lot of, a lot of experience so you know um, you need to spend the time of Every time you get a bite, just go and just plonk the GPS. Or if you've got your little phone there, um, just put it on that for, for the <coughs> time being and transfer it later. So try and get as much data as you can. Okay? And, and knowing um, when to drop your line, especially if that current comes up a bit later, as I said, sometimes we have to allow six to seven minutes to get uh, our line down. So we have to um, put that into perspective in our drift to land on the spots, like, like parachuting and landing on the X. You've got to be spot on to get those fish. Um, your spot lock on your on your electric or on your boat or on your um, iPod drive things or whatever. Um, it won't work in current. It doesn't work in current. It's too hard. 
So when you get a lot of current, people say, oh, good, I can hold myself in the spot. That's not, that's, it doesn't work that way. They're only good for holding wind. So if it's windy, um, you're going to stay in position, there's no current, it's straight down. If you've got a, no wind and strong current, you put, put your, your lock on, the motors, the whole boat's talking and it's so hard, it's very ab abrupt. The motors rev up and they go backwards and your lines chook out the back like that, even with a six pound lead on because it's just too hard to fish in that current. You, you're better off drifting. So remember to use only the, the, that um, part of your boat if it's no current or less than a knot. Okay. So the same as when you're fishing the flat, isn't it? It's, that's only good in the wind because you get more fish on the drift. Um, apart from that, we were saying before about deploying your stuff. So we've found the spot, we've worked out our drift, we've got our baits all on, we've put our baits on properly, like I said um, before. Oh, so I like to use the pilchers burly. I have tried burly cages, clipped off my, I even tried my spinning crab bait cages off the top of my snap. Um, I don't think it caught me any more fish, and it was, every time I looked over and saw the red wide basket, I thought I had a flame snapper on, and I realised it was a red basket. So <laughs> so, got my hopes up there a little bit. Um, so, I wouldn't worry about you don't need a burly basket in that depth. If they're going to bite, they're going to bite through the others, what, what you put down there. But what you need to do is you need to have your hooks ready to roll. Now, I said before, don't put your snap swivel because it wears them out, but I always use my guides for my hooks. I just hook the tip in, whichever way it is. Yeah, just like that. <laughs> so, put my glass on there and see. Um, so I just hook them in, ready to go. So my bait's hanging off there, right? And um, I'll just hook it in wherever it might be. Doesn't matter. Just whichever way. Like so. And ready to go. And my sink is sitting there. And all I do is I just undo that. And I chuck out the first bait, chuck out the second bait. And just a little tiny bit of current, or just some momentum of the boat if you have on spot lock, will just take those baits away from the boat. And then I grab my sinker and I make sure it's tied on properly because I've lost a few sinkers <laughs> over the time. Um, and I'm using a 100 pound breakaway, as I said. Sometimes when I'm in the real deep water and I've got my bigger rod, I'll, I'll double up that 100 and it's about a metre and a half long. And then I'll, once I've got all my, all my hooks out and it's clear, then I'll just throw the sinker out with my hand on the spool at the same time because I, that momentum that hitting the water is going to rip that line off so fast. Uh, if I'm using that something that big, something like that, I don't worry about it. Throw it out, and it just does its own thing. Okay, um, so um, never put the sinker in first and then throw the hooks in. It doesn't work that way. You probably get one in your leg and hanging half over the side of the boat, getting ripped in the water. So don't do that, please. Um, please deploy the hooks first. Um, say never the sinker first. Never the sinker first. No, it's too dangerous. Especially a circle hook, so just go straight in. They don't miss. Anyone had a circle hook in their hand before? Yeah, have you, mate? Oh, okay. How'd you go? Not good. <laughs> Not good, yeah. I got one of my thumb once, actually, my wife. That's a long story. But uh, the doctor couldn't even get it out to get us from it out. Um, but, um, yeah, so be careful, please. Um, when you've got the fish coming up, um, I never had problems with sharks eating fish. I had a couple of makos around the boats out there, but not, you know, we're all having shark problems inside the 100 metres at the moment, especially in, on the close reefs and even out, out wider. Um, but out there, uh, I've, I've had two makos over time come up, and especially that 280 metre mark eating our, our kings and stuff. Um, but I've never had sharks eat a cod or a, in the deeper water. I never had a shark bite my line off it, I think, out there. So it doesn't seem, the sharks don't seem to live down that deeper water. That's what I'm trying to say. They're pretty safe. The fish can sit on top of the water. Um, but as always, like I said with the pearlies before, if you get the fish close to the boat, just reach over and get it in the boat as quick as you can. Gaff it, whatever you've got to do to get it in. Okay. Um, be careful of, of the cod. They do have a couple of nasty spikes on the top of them. You don't want those going into your foot. And they're quite big and quite slippery. The most important part is grabbing a cod. Does anyone know how to grab a cod without getting their hands in pile in the gills? Because they're like teeth that hook into you. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever got caught in a cod? Yeah. It's quite hard to get out a big cod, <laughs> especially when they're still breathing they, and they clasp onto you like this. So what you do right at the top part of the gill, which is towards, it, towards his mouth, the last part where it joins, where that part joins on to it, there's a little section there you can actually slide your hand up 
under and and towards the, his, his lip okay that's the only way you can grab a cod and grab it and, and not get impaled you still might get a little bit impaled i've got some marks in my hand across the top here from the other day but if you put it down further where you get a little grip on it it's just going to do you big time okay so be careful of that and that's any cod too by the way um probably about all i need to tell you on that I'll go to the marks. So just if you guys want to go through these marks, can, you, can everyone see that okay? But what, what sort of sound are you reckon? Oh yeah, sounders, yeah. Okay, before we go here, sorry guys. Um, it, you know, in sounders, there's, most sounds these days are pretty good, but you're gonna need, a, a, it's more of the transducer. You're gonna need a one kilowatt to get over 300 meters. So 300 meters, 600 watts is fine, which is a standard type transducer. Um, you just go to low frequency and dial the gain up a little bit and you'll pick up the bottom out on most sounds out to about 200 to maybe 300 but as soon as you start zooming, so you'll see the bottom okay, but as soon as you start zooming into like 20, 10 or 20 meter window, it just loses it, it, it goes all crazy. It, so that's putting on the power in that one area doesn't quite work. If you've got a, um, a, a one kilowatt, preferably high or low frequency, not a mid not a mid one or not a broadband type one, you want a narrow beam preferably. Um and one seventy five sort of Yeah, one seventy five or two sixty two sixty five is it? Yeah, in that area yeah, but one seventy five is the most powerful type one. Um in a one kilowatt. And uh, I had a Simrad before I, I like Garmin, I like Simrad and um I don't mind um some of the Fruno stuff, but the Fruno is very uh, awkward to use, it's expensive as well, and it's supposed to be the best, but um, well, in previous sounds I've had the pictures been probably like one fifth the price for a similar picture. Yeah, but the but some of the ones now they've got like scanning in deep water and left, right, and especially in the Bruno and the Garmin's, they're pretty good. Yeah, yeah, so um, it just depends what you're going to spend. It's always funny, I always say to my customers, you know, you spend you buy your boat, that's important. You spend 10k on electronics, but they won't spend a k on a fishing rod. <laughs> and I said, but you need the fishing rod to get the fish that they find sound, sound as finding. So anyway, that's a long story again. But um, <laughs> but uh, one kilowatt, mate. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, at least. Okay, so um, getting back to this here. So remember, I spoke to you before about trying to look at being sort of 28, 28 or 28, 25, somewhere in that area. Um, so that top first mark is 28, 29, so it's very far north, okay? So it's probably just as close to go from uh, Cleveland out around South Passage as it is to go from here to the CYL. Um, how many people who fish off Brisbane go through South Passage Bar? Yeah, A couple of you do, yeah. So you guys have got really good grounds just to the, to the north. Um, if you go out and sort of, um, sort of, yeah, dog leg about probably, I think it's around, 45 degrees, 30 degrees is it? 45 degrees. Which sort of takes you about halfway up Morton. And there's so many good grounds up there. I mean, about that 280 to 360 meter mark. I know quite a few of the guys, Peter and a few other guys fish up there a lot and get all the species we're talking about plus. Um, it's not as fished as hard because it's it's also a long run, as you know, it's probably 75 Ks, I think, mm -hmm. up to there from, say, Cleveland. Uh, so it's a bit of a run, but, um, or you go down this way, which is probably similar. <laughs> so take your pick. Um, I haven't fished much north. I have fished off north a couple of times, but um, my, most of my fishing is look out down to Brunswick or by sort of area. Um, so get to the next one. Um, that one's in 52. So 52 is around about um, 280 metres, okay? Next one's 53, some similar depth, about a mile south. Um, the next one is similar depth. Um, about another nearly a mile south again, so you know, 31. Um, the next one that is at 27.35, which is sort of halfway down North Strati, and it's in about 300 metres, I dare say, so looking at that, or 400 metres maybe. That might be the 350 metre mark we, we fished the other day in that area. You need to put all these in your GPS to get the perspective of where you are. Um, the next one is uh, the 35496, that one, which is the fifth mark along. That one is in similar area. It's actually the, so looking, if you, if, you, if some of you might know how to read GPS numbers. So the fifth mark is actually 
northwest of the fourth mark. So that's like the top and the bottom of the drift. And they're about, looking at that, they're about 500 metres apart. So it's like that. On a, so on a north, obviously I've been out there in a blind northeast. Oh, sorry, south, uh, northwest, um, of that, which is at the moment sort of thing. So you start on the fifth mark and drift down to the fourth mark. Because they're, they're not in the right way in the four mark here, sorry. Um, your next one, 39, so that's nearly, that's sort of about uh, three miles north of Pin Bar, but out in about, um, uh, that looks like around nearly Jimmy's actually, but around about um, four, at 50, at 153, 54, you're in about 400 metres or 500 metres deep. Um, and the next mark is, I think, is Jimmy's. What's Jimmy's on, do you know? Um, no, I couldn't see it. Yeah. Yeah, my I phone's can, there, but I can't. I can read you the chart now. Yeah. <coughs> While Wayne's looking at that, let's go to the next one. So 49, 5, 6, 5, 1, 5, 3, 57. As you go further south, right? So the 50, to give you some idea perspective, 50 feathers of jumping pin, you're on longitude of 1, 53, 42 or 43, okay? When you're off Tweed Heads on 50 feathers, which is very close to the coastline down there, you're actually on 153. 47. So you're actually four miles east of off the pin to the same depth. Because the bottom, because the, you know, the, the, the gold test kicks out at the bottom there, so that whole land's pushed out a bit further. Jim's is 27.45. 45 is it, mate? Okay, yeah. thanks a lot, mate. So 27.45 is um, not on there. Hmm, okay. Oh, yeah, oh yes, it is. So it is. 57. 57. Okay, you're right. So it's number 11 spot. So that's Jim's Mountain. Um, yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks, and mate. That's, that's what you're saying. It's pretty good. Sorry, mate. It's pretty good uh, snapper at all. Oh, no, that one's uh, Blue Eye. Oh, Blue Eye, right. Bass Groper, Barcod, Gemfish, and many other species. Those are just cats and cats and a mole. Dirty old squids. Oh, sorry? Dirty, dirty old. Oh, like mullerfills. Yeah. So, yeah, over 200 metres go to mullerfills. Yeah. yeah, but we use squid and pilch it as it's the burly with it. So put the multiple on too, but yeah. Um, the next page is um, 2802. So that's about off sort of Q1 area. Um, and 55 is sort of, um, it's in about 300 metres. I think that's a couple of marks that we fish, marker 516. 310 metres. Okay, the depth's on some of these guys. You can see that there. And look at that. Depths on most of them, <laughs> I'm guessing the depth. So it's 310 metres, so um, that'd be definitely, um, remember I was telling you how it sort of cuts out just off the seaway, just south of the seaway, that's about the southern end of that, of that 300, 280, 300 metre mark for catching uh, flamies and barcod and stuff like that. Then there's a big gap until you get all the way down to um, about 2813, which is sort of off Tweed Eds, which is uh, on the second page, it's the fourth mark. So it's on the similar longitude, similar depth, but there's nothing, I've got nothing in between. You guys, has anyone got any stuff in between there? Which is sort of surface down to about tweed in 300 metres. Welcome to share. Yeah. <laughs> um, What's the military practice area? Oh, that's the whole of Australia. <laughs> it just comes up in the <laughs> It just comes up on the GPS, is that, mate? So I, I'm going to tell you, sorry, I don't know if you guys have seen the Navy got boat set here once. We were down on Tweed once in about 220 metres. And we had this Navy patrol boat, like a like the destroyer boats. Mate, those things, they're fast. Have you seen them go? They looked like 40 knots or 30 something knots. And this thing was down there, and we are fishing away, and it was only about 2Ks out from us. And next minute it was past us, like, I mean, no time. And it only went past us about probably 2Ks, we were watching it. And then it just done at full speed, a full lock. Like, I mean, like, I don't know how much it leant over. And come straight down the other side of us. <laughs> we were crapping ourselves. And uh, <laughs> it was uh, extremely fast. I could not believe it. Yeah, I couldn't believe how fast it was. Many years ago, I've got a lot of stories, a lot of fishing out here. But many years ago, we were off um, jumping pin in 50, at the 50,000 reef back in late 80s. And not many people knew about it those days. And, um, we were, or just inside of there, and uh, we, we were crapping ourselves, because that was, when, on those days you could hear all the Taiwanese and all the Asian people on the radio, on the 27 meg radios, 
wasn't many VHF radios back then. And um, we had, it's absolutely scared the crap out. It was an old Bill that's with us. He had been in the Second World War, the old dude. He used to work for me back in the old shop back in the days, the 90s. And uh, he, um, he goes, holy crap. And we didn't know what he was talking about. We looked out and the submarine surfaced like 300 <laughs> meters behind us, out of the water like they come out like they do. Absolutely, we didn't know if it was ours or Russian or what it was. And so we called the Coast Guard, well, hiding behind us. <laughs> 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 and they go, don't worry, we'll check on it. And they rang us back and they said, oh, it's one of ours. <laughs> so, don't worry. We didn't crap it out, so it was like, we put the throttle down and take off, you know. Uh, anyhow, that was back in the day. Sorry. That catches too. Sorry? It's an early catcher as well. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> I think that'll get, that'll, they're fast too, you're probably right at that one, Alan. Um, so the next one, uh, the number five on the spot on there, so that's the start of the uh, Tweed Canyon, so 2814, 15354, uh, depth 600 metres. So that's about as deep as we fish for the blue eyes. I put that in there to show you that's about as deep as I go, and that's the mark that we've actually caught fish at. Um, I get a lot of blue eye cod down that way of Tweed. If you do tow your boat down the Tweed and get to the Tweed Bar, just because of the Tweed Bar, but um, it is so close down there. It's like closer than going at the 40 fathoms, uh, 50 fathoms out here. Okay, it's about 30. It changes all the time. So generally you run up towards Kiraway or uh, Point Danger, then then dog leg back south. Yeah, it, it changes all the time. How do you how do you decide like throughout the season whether you're going to go up? Or uh, we or just down or? if we have a bad run twice yeah. in the same area, we'll go that way. <laughs> um, or but but since these new maps have come out, they only come out in the last six months to most people, you know. Um, there are so many grounds we, I don't know, but we're not a good bit down south, because uh, it's just too good out here at the moment. But every time we go out, we try and make the time to try one of the spots we've marked off, off the maps. Um, but we, we're now, uh, the sound is a bit so good, um, we're now finding new grounds before we even get to those marks. And we drop down and catch fish and we back out, so you can go home, yeah. It's really like that. The trouble is that when you fish in deep water, once you've got your fish, you can't really throw them back because they don't live. They, they've got the bends and their stuff. Okay. Um, five minutes to go, quickly do this. Uh, so, I don't know, there's one mark there that's a bit skew with. That's at the, on the second page, the eighth mark. That should be back up the other in town. <laughs> Um, and then that's the Tweed Canyons running down along the Tweed Canyons. Um, the 52 marks, see those 52 marks, which is the bottom three on the second page? That's the 200 metre line, 220 metre line, starting about off Tweed Heads, where the kingies, the snapper, bar cod, you get ocean perch, which are like a pinky crimson colour perch, they're beautiful. So do you go to Tweed Bar on that path? No, we, just go, we go from the seaway down. It's about 60k run or 55k run. Um, but if you go to Tweed Bar, it's only about it's 37k. Yeah, it's not too far. Do you like that Tweed area? Oh, I love the Tweed area. It's very good. Very good. Um, it's a surprise me because I go out there and I always see guys in like a 14 foot naughty glass or something like that, like a little tiny boat fishing away with electrics out in, in uh, with a 60 horse pattern back or 50 horse pattern back out, out in that depth. <laughs> I don't see that out here, you know. But it's so, so close, that's why, yeah. How many hooks are you allowed to run in New South Wales? Three. three. Yeah, you're allowed to run six up here, three yeah. down there. Make so sure please remember that. Yeah. You can cut your rig off, of course, with Griff Cup too. But <laughs> with Griff Scissors, but um, you're going to lose your rig and sink it. So I'd, um, I'd run three all the time. And the fisheries down there are pretty, pretty onto it sometimes. How many so, do they run up here? Six. But I would never run six on electric because you've got six cod on that size. First, it's too many fish, and uh, and secondly, is it's um, I don't know if they pull it up. <laughs> we got because you know, the best I think it's did a show on Creek the Coast uh, about 2005 or something like that with the guys from Springwood Marine, with Gary when he's doing the business, and um, on his cat and I got a it's on the show I got a the biggest cod I've ever caught I think it was a bass grouper it was at at Riviera Grounds it was 75 kilos it was a monster one. I got a 30 kilo blue eye 
and about a 30 kilo bar called a trifecta on one, one line. So I was like, 150 kilos of fish coming up in one go, you know. We had a, we had a uh, crystal reel, crystal deep, oh, he had a crystal reel, I use those, uh, with his own little built in rod thing. It blew up. It, it hooked up similar, I think. It blew up. One meter just pulled it up. It struggled a bit, but <laughs> got it up. Uh, it, it actually, the other one locked up and blew up. And we got it all on television, of course. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a fantastic day. But those days, not many people used to do it out there, you know. They still don't. So, uh, fishing in four to 500 meters is a bit of an art to it. Different to 200 or 300. Yeah, once you go around that 500 meter mark, yeah, it's all becomes another level again. But you guys can learn to do it. It's not that hard. You just have to understand your drift and backing the boat up and that sort of stuff. Okay. But my suggestion is, um, use those numbers to start you off. Um, there's definitely fish in all those. They're all out of my phone, they're all my marks. Um, and there'll be marks around those marks, okay? Um, for those of you who come to the Pearly one the other day, you got all those marks there. Has anyone tried those marks yet? They come to the Pearl Perch Seminar? Just dropped the reason on my Did you? There's a reason for that. <laughs> 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 These ones here are they're harder to fish, so I don't mind you sharing these <laughs> straight <laughs> off the bat. <laughs> no, I'll sort them out for you. But, um, so, um, when you get out to the area, you you look around, you find stuff. Make sure you zoomed into about. When I'm in, in under 100 meters, I'm like a 10 meter window. Okay. When I'm in under 200, I'm a 20 meter window. When I'm out at 300, I'm about a 30 meter window. Because sometimes the fish are stacked 20 meters off the bottom or 30 meters off the bottom, right? And if you only zoom in 10 meters, you won't see it. So just try and 10 meters for every 100 meters on your if you use that as a scale. That's pretty well spot on. As a general rule in deep, is there anything sort of mid-water or three-quarters? Yeah, there's a, we get a lot of scatter layers. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't, Wayne might be a bit, Wayne does a lot of games, so I keep referring to Wayne. But there's a lot of plankton, squid, stuff like that. I was telling John uh, earlier oh, today, um, when I was, because I always want to catch that when I was big red Humboldt squid. They've got to be out here, eh? They're, just, they're at New Cal, in a similar area to Brisbane, like right? New Cal, the same latitude sort of thing. And um, the, I, I had a, they used to do really big squid jigs used to sell years ago. They're like, like 25 centimetres or 20 centimetres long, big suckers. There's about a three ounce weight on it. And I put one on my, off my top snap and I dropped it down in 500 metres deep at, at Jim's or Riviera Grounds, I can't remember which one. Um, I got a cod at, at the same bite. I didn't see what happened, didn't see the bite on the other one, but I was pulled the cod up my squid jig come up and it had a perfect bite like that out of the squid jig. The body's a bit big on the squid jig, quite a big squid jig, right? And it was just a big chunk out of it like that. And there was about 10 or five mil left that was holding it together. <laughs> so I'm guessing it wasn't a fish, I'm guessing it was a big squid of some type, but I missed a big jag in the end. Unfortunately, I didn't know there was any squid jig out that size. So I can't buy them. So I don't know how to, I can get these ones out of a whole heap of Jags, but I want to get try and see the humble squid here because those things are really nice to eat. The dangerous things, but they're great things they're to catch. Dangerous. Yeah, have you ever caught one? Mate? Uh, I don't know if they're humble. I was I was at the on a friend's boat, Graham Coy's boat. Yes, out of the sea now, so we oh, yeah. caught a whole of these big, nasty red. Yeah, because Casper's with you, right? He told yeah. me he reckons they're humbles, but well, it's a different version. Well, I don't version. know, but, but you yeah. put them in the tank together, they would eat each other. Yeah, and yeah. You put one on a they're pool, savage. We caught more squid. <laughs> they were just. Terrible things, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. Really did you try hard. eating them though? Uh, oh yeah, we did eat them. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're they're nice. All right. They're yeah. squid. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Uh, but whether they're humbolts or not, I don't mm. know. They're big and really aggressive. Yeah, that's it. In very deep water, you know. Yeah, yeah. Over and red, super red colour. Red. Yeah. yeah. In the middle of the night, yeah, all yeah. around the back of the boat. Yeah, wow. Well, so they come up. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow. That's another fishery we talk about all the time, but <laughs> I reckon they're because he's getting the scatterlays. So get back to your question. Um, you might be say 400 meters deep or 300 meters deep and at about 120 to 160 will just be this big belt of stuff come through your sounder. It's not your sounder playing up, it's actually something, plankton or squid or bait or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. Is there many guys troll at the moment? How many people troll catch marlin that sort of thing? Yeah, it's the hottest blue marlin bite we've had for a little while. At right now as we speak happening out there. Yeah. We're at there Monday, and I was just started on Sunday, I'd say, because I didn't hear about the Sunday date. We're at there Monday, and 
from the bottom dropping out there and there's like seven boats trolling around us. I said, my mate, is there, is there a comp on? <laughs> but I see seven boats trolling around me out there off the canyons off the uh, lookout. And um, and then on the radio, they're all days, everyone's catching them home, you know. And it's got better and better each day, apparently. The nine for nines and that today. Yeah. And it's a good fish up to like 250 kilos, you know. Yeah. So you can also troll while you're looking around for your fish. And that's how we find a lot of our fish in summer. We troll obviously for marlin and dolphin fish and wahoo. And we're, I'm just, it's like if you're a game fisherman, you look at that top 30 metres, I'm looking at the bottom 30. And my mate's always saying, turn the friggin' sound all around. I can't see the bait. <laughs> it's it's going to hit anyhow. I want to see the bottom. <laughs> so, like, doink, 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 doink. Mark at the bottom all the time. You know? So there's so many Mark and Jerry Grounds out here. But uh, so you guys, have, you've got all the latest technology. You've got the bath, bathy maps, you've got Navionics, and you've got um, the, Nav, uh, the Garmin. See, Captain, I'm just Captain. Captain, Captain, sorry, Active Captain. Uh, to help you out to find the spots which we've never had for the last 20 years. It's only come out this year. And I'm like super excited about it because, as I said, it's been hours marking these marks, which I probably need to not get to fish them all, but they're off our coastline here. And there's a lot of stuff even in that 120, 150, 180 might need to mark the stuff everywhere. And any little indentation or any little rise or any little ridge, you mark it and you try it. Okay? So there'll be fish there. But zoom in, like I said, 10, 20, or 30 meters, depending on the depth you're at. And, and just look around. Don't go fast when, you, when, you, um, when you're sounding around too much as well. Spend time to go slowly. Spend the time to understand your drift when you get there. You've got your gear baited up, you're ready to roll and understand your drift and um, and then go up appropriately to the same distance that you just drifted based on the time it's going to get to the bottom. If you do that in that certain depth, each time allow a bit longer to get down. And um, when it hits the bottom, remember to reverse up or make sure your line's got a bit of slack in it the whole time. You saw there, that happens all the time. So your line's like that, you might get a bite. As soon as you let a bit of line out, it, they just bite. They just, they hook, because they're circles, they hook up straight away. And you've got them. And then just bring them up. Don't bring them up too fast because you'll lose them, okay? Um, and that's probably all I've got to tell you. Is there any questions you guys have got at all? No? Is what are you looking for clear? in the hollow on the sounder? In a, what are you looking for in the hollow? Is yeah, okay. So spots, we, we, we found a new... Oh, it just comes up as a lot of fish. Um, when I... I'm going to go downstairs and I'll, I'll give it a note to it, but have you guys done, you don't know how to crimp a crimp properly? Or have you ever, does anyone have trouble doing the crimping? Does anyone want to watch how to do the crimping properly? I'll just quickly show you how to do it downstairs, okay? Because last time when we did that, we had a few guys that didn't do their crimps properly. They were doing it the wrong way and I almost hit that one. Um, so I'm just going to show you that time. But when I go down, I'll bring my phone down and I'll just show you what the bottom look, looks like. I've got so many photos. Shots. So I'll show you and what to look for. But generally, it's stuff that is anywhere from right hung in the bottom. There must be a lot of um, like wire, not wiry, but some sort of coral down there because sometimes my sinker does drag, gets stuck through it. I don't think it's rock, it's actually like dragging and slowly though. Um, and then there's a bit of current, and that you'll see that fuzz on the sounder, then you'll see all the fish above it. Um, no bull crap in most areas between 220 and and 500 meters deep your fish average fish amount on this on the bottoms are between 10 and 40 meters thick of fish that's a big spill of fish okay there's a lot uh, for those of you who've been in that area you will know what i'm talking about and the the flame snapper tend to come up like a bait school red hard rock hard ball Okay, so that's your flame snapper. Your cod will be amongst that crap on the bottom. You just see the odd big fish in amongst all that sort of strain stuff. Um, the the green eye sharks just come up as like a lot of fish because <laughs> there's a lot of sharks. Um, and the blue eye are just like they're they're sometimes off the bottom and sometimes on the bottom. They're a bit in between. They can be 30, 20, 30 minutes off the bottom. The fish will come down to your bait though. Is that what? low frequency? Low frequency in the deeper water, yeah. I find high frequency works good up to about 300 metres on a good set, almost one kilowatt. Um, then over there, because your, your, your beam is bigger, wider, it's harder to get to the bottom and get the picture. Yeah. So you need to narrow it down a bit. Yeah. 
Hey, back on the weights and that, like, yeah. what, what do you what do you find yourself using yeah. on the, like the one, it one two, and three hundred? You know, like it's, yeah. So it depends on um, the current and the wind on the day. So as I said, I'll use that in um, I'll use that in uh, sometimes in one hundred and twenty meters, and I'll sometimes use it in four hundred meters. What's, what's that there? Uh, that's one uh, three pounds. Okay. Yeah. And that one there, sometimes I'll, 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 yeah, sometimes I use that in 300 meters if the current's really bad. Yeah, right. Yeah. Also, why did you send the jig down on there? Uh, so your jigs, um, we're going to do a bit on jigging tonight, but we're going to leave this one mate, um, Hayden's un unable to make it tonight, but he's a real good jig and jigs a lot in three to 400 meters, or 250 is 400, 350. And um, it's all depending on the line you're using, not the, jig, the jig so much. So, your line should be like PE3. So, you know, normally you jig 80 pound on the, on the kings, out there you don't. You jig lighter for bigger. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, they're right. different fighting fish. So they pull hard, but they don't pull hard and fast. So it's pull hard. So, and the structure, well, the structure is bad, but sometimes I lose a lot of, lot of lead weights. Um, but I haven't um, jigged much over about 300, 350. I jigged once out of, at Jimmy's and hooked up something, but it, uh, it did miss the hook, scratched the jig though. Took me an hour fighting the jig up to get it up to the top again. <laughs> it's very hard work. Now it's on 80 pounds. So these days, and that was an old thick 80, which is like probably 120 these days. So um, most guys are using like small reels, two to two to 4,000 size, uh, P3 to even P2, to uh, P5 maybe at the max. And they're using at least 400 meters of braid on their reels. So they're only using small reels, but very powerful reels. So you need that thinness to get down, and, and with that they're using like about 300 grams. So 100 grams sort of every 100 meters. That's always the, the scenario with, um, with G. So 300 meters, 300 grams, 400, 400 500, 500, you know? Yeah, uh, when you got current though, wind, you might have, to have even double that. So um, we, got some, we had some shop down here with some Ocean Legacies, they're called Heavy, heavy G or some Heavy something or other. Um, they are, um, 520, 620, 720 grams, I think they're quite chunky, but they're very hard work. Yeah. But you're not doing fast jigging out there, you're just doing lift, lift up, and just drop it back down again. And maybe just take it a little bit slow up and then lift it back up again, drop back down. And you're using quite a long rod, um, and soft, very soft. And that's when you see those Japanese, we've got those big cods and fish, so hold the rod straight and just walk like this. Because <laughs> you can't get any power on the rod to lift the fish. But that, you need that action to make the lure work properly. You can't use a stiff rod, it doesn't work on light line. Okay. Yeah. And that was with, um, probably easy for some, but I mean, with your, with your breakaways, like, mm. you, can, you can make up whatever you like, but how are you generally tying your, your breakaways? You okay, make, like, so, a loop at the end, or? Uh, I just make a loop at the end, loop it through. Yeah, okay. 100%. Because yeah. uh, I can change my sink over quickly. Yeah. Um, with the, like lead's expensive, you all know lead's very expensive, you have to buy sheet leads like whatever it is, 12 bucks a kilo or something. So, um, what you, and that's four kilos, so it's expensive. So, um, what you need to do, we sell them obviously, but we sell lots of them too, by the way. And some days I lose lots of them, which I hate. But, um, compared to fuel, whatever, it's probably not the dearest part of the trip, but you need to like look at a cheaper alternative, like Rio Bar or whatever you can find and uh, heat shrink it, or you can um, wrap it uh, with zip ties and, and then hook, tie the mainline with the zip tie. Whatever it takes to get down there, but don't use chunky stuff, don't use like a house brick. Okay, it needs to be long and cylindrical, or that sort of shape. Even this one here is a bit chunky, but it'll still work. A bit like a plumb bob style. But um, that sort of style is a lot better, it goes straight down. Um, sometimes it's cheaper now to use a, a 400 gram jig to get you down. Problem is, if you use too big a bait, it becomes like a, a pain, like a, an anchor off, the, off your line. So it doesn't allow it to get down as quick because you're using two big chunky things that are spinning loads of joint the way down and it drags your line out a long way. So that's why I keep my bait small and still get the big fish yeah. off. Yeah. Everything that's yeah. as big as I'll use that size. You know? I'm not being rude here, but it's a size I'm sort of using. Um, and um, it tends to allow my bait to, that's the reason I didn't tell you earlier, but that's the reason why I use small baits to get down quicker, with less lead. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions at all, folks? Okay, so you need to just go that little bit further, guys. 
a little bit further. Just crimp your way out. If you've got a big enough boat, then just go for it. If you have no electrics, we sell them. We match, or actually, we do, for the next couple of weeks, we'll do 5% off the best price online on electric reels. And, um, and the rods, same deal, we look after. And to braid them up, that's what we sell most of. We sell about half a dozen of these sort of outfits a week, roughly speaking. But they go a lot of places, they go up the north, they go everywhere. Um, but 80 pound, that's what I'm using at the moment on my, my outfits. Um, you don't need colour line, multi-colour line, because do the depth counters on the reel. That's more accurate than you're watching it. So you just use one colour. Um, and it's cheap, it's about 100 bucks to spoil a thousand metres. And it's good braid, it's not crap. And the, the leads and the pods and all So the leads, uh, yeah, so good question. Um, for those of you who might already have electrics, if you just clip on the battery, it's great. But I have two leads for each of my reels. The one's got an encoder plug on it. I try and use an encoder plug because I find they're the best. I've had Anderson plugs in my old boat and everything is wear out all the time or corrode out. The, the encoder plug's the same you use on the electric outboards. So it's like a three pin thing that goes in and locks and doesn't come out. And it's very waterproof and uh, it's all stainless and it just doesn't break. Okay. And then you just hook it up to the battery? Yeah, hook it directly to your battery. You must keep the motor going the whole time of your boat. Only once ever have we flattened our batteries and got a bit caught out, but we got the motor. Yeah, I mine just unplugged it. I hooked yeah. it in, I didn't realise it was 36 volt from the freaking area coming up on you. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, you're right. Yeah, it's it, like oh, because off your, um, off your yeah, the a, a, yeah, electric, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So make sure it's 12 volt. <laughs> okay, Which so. Is the brush, brushless reel? Yeah, the, the, the Beastmaster. The Beastmasters are about, well, today they're about 22,040 bucks. I think they're 2,100 online, it's the best price. Oh, sorry, it's about, about 2,000 bucks, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they are. So that's the Beastmaster. That's the Beastmaster, that's what Shimano, I reckon. Yeah. Shimano, yeah. yeah. They're, they're the thing, like we sold some of these today. Uh, they're just really, really good. Yeah. So yeah. is that, even the Force Master and the Beastmaster, is they're, 600 bucks? Yeah, that's so about 500 bucks difference. So what do you reckon? Uh, it, <laughs> if you can afford the Beastmaster, go for it. They've if got, you, got a 10 year warranty, haven't they? They've both got a 10 year warranty. Um, as I said, I fish both. I fish both. I haven't seen the difference in the power, but if you can afford the Beastmaster, go. How's that sound? But you don't need to go. And the chain one, that's just as good. The Force Master. Exactly the same size, same drag, same power, same everything, same guts, same internal. No, no, maybe the other one. Oh, the Speedmaster? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, not the Speedmaster, the, uh, what's it called? Yeah. Plays, sorry. That's just a good yeah. start out rod. Yeah, it's just a smaller yeah. one. Yeah. So that if you're gonna, not going to go fishing over 400 metres, that's it. They'll pull up all your cods, everything, and the kit's about 300 bucks to be started today. Yeah. And that'll do the job. Um, and this one's the Force Master. <laughs> uh, we do sell divers downstairs too. If you want, if you want to get something a bit cheaper, the divers, you get a bit bigger reel than that one, but I believe that one's a lot more powerful. Okay. Um, the, I, I, I've got two divers, had a cons myself, I know what they, what they can do. Can that be the one draws more or less? No, they don't. Same. Good question though. Uh, same, same amperage, right? Just one's a brushless motor. Uh, they call it a Gigamax motor. It apparently is a expensive little motor. Mm -hmm. That's in that one. Um, and this one's a, a brush motor. But uh, like die, my diatonicoms quite often will stop and beep, beep, beep and carry on till they get cool down to that microsecond and then they start going again. These may stop if your drag's too loose. You tighten up a bit more and just put more power on it and just cranks it up. And they never stop from load. Okay. Not that not, not, I've had yet anyway. You start getting lazy using those bad since I'm. No, you don't actually because I'm jigging all the time. I did. I, oh, you, you've got, just, that's what you've got, one, What do you mean? <laughs> it's a special button. Yeah. So uh, no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're getting real lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. If you're into drinking time, gave us the spot, so you're <laughs> if you're into drinking time, you're welcome to do that. But my suggestion is don't use them under hundred, under ninety meters, any eighty meters. Yeah. We were at Rainbow three weeks ago. Yes. And getting shark pretty bad. Yes. Yeah. Put the electrics out. We're only at sixty meters. Yeah. Never got shark. Either. Okay, exactly right, mate. So this one's something that we sell a lot up north, and um, I got a mate of mine that's got a his boat up at Hamilton Island, and. Um, they're just getting sharked all the time, so I sold them Beastmaster. 
Uh, he went up there with the Beastmaster. He's like four other mates, the other four of the boat. Um, they captured the guy, large mouth the guy, and the sharks just smashed them. He got every fish to the boat. I sold four now to his mates. <laughs> <laughs> now they all just go, pull them up. What do you put that down to? Mm. Why wouldn't the sharks bite a fish off one of those? Speed. Constant. You take Constant the chance. Speed. So it's, the, it it's just the speed, the speed of bringing it up. Yeah. yeah. You can you can go you can tell them go fast. They're very fast. It's the pumping and whining. As soon as you stop to pump, yeah, and whine, that's when they grab it. Yeah. Turns his head. Yeah. Shark just yeah. just brings it up on a steady yeah. pace. Yeah, yeah. That's what we do. So yeah, you will you will. And then my mate said the same too. He said you you do that way, but you will lose the old fish because especially you get a bit stressed and crank the speed up. They're just very fast, and the odd fish falls pop off. But you yeah, pop the eyes. <laughs> The fish falls off, but um, they just get them up now, you know. The, the, but you've got to remember, at the end of the day, whether you're electric reel fishing, or because people say, oh, electric reel's going to break the ocean, but that's not the truth. We've all got bag limits, whether you catch them by hand, line, rod and reel, or electric rod and reel. It's all the same story. So with the fish are, it doesn't make any, any uh, influence on the fishing at all. It just means we get to take home a bit more fish, maybe. That's not that big deal. That doesn't make sense, but... The, the bag limits? <laughs> yes. You're fishing the tweed, you travel back up here the yeah. same way? You have to, you have to, that's a real tricky one again. Yeah. So, it also regards to line and hooks and your rod too. So, um, like I said, talked about earlier, you have to stick by Queensland rules. But you have to be in New South, you have to do both. Yeah. You yeah. have to be in New South Wales laws when you're down there. And then... How do they know when you're... Uh, go check on yeah, it's a bit like cutting the rig off, you know. You take the, run the gorton, what they say. But um, so you, with your bag limits too. Like yeah, so your bag limits are down there. Like the squire is only thirty-five, and also down thirty-eight. I think it's yeah. and, and and pearl is in there. I think a, a six. I think is it. We're we're four, and things like that. So um, you can catch more down there and smaller. But when once you get into if you go caught in the seaway, yeah. they don't give a shit if you've been where you've been. <laughs> You're in Queensland, mate. So that's the law. Uh, so yeah, but. The good thing about out the deep water, you rarely get any unsized. It's all big, yeah. Even out in that, that 200 metre area of tweed, it's all big. So um, you don't have to worry about that, about sizing. It'll be Queensland size. Just on the, the meat before, with your brains and water out, was that everything apart from pearls? Is that, is that what no, it's all anything over sort of 200 metres deep. Okay. Yeah, or 300. It's, it's mainly to do with cod and blue eye, okay. to be actually honest with you. If you've got flamies, I don't have that drama. It's just those really slimy. Yeah. They've got like about a three mil mucus on the outside of them. And they're very hard to fill it, so you always go slide off everywhere. So you get the gurney out there. <laughs> gurney them off and then clean them, you know? Yeah, right. They're quite dangerous. How many times they need to land on my feet? Uh, but yeah, so. Um, so they barcode in, say, 150, like we have got. Uh, yeah, barcode 150 would probably be no worries at all. Yeah. It's only like 200. And as I said, it's to do with the I think it's to do with the water pressure and to do with the coldness set down that depth, okay. and it does something that they have to do to make them sustainable. The bottom there, and, um, and the restaurant, the you know, cooks or whatever they've worked out, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. How do you um, How do you break the rig off if you're hooking up on? Yeah, the that's really the question too, mate, which I haven't covered. Yeah, sometimes we wrap around the bollard if it's on a big boat, <laughs> and hope that just the the lurch of the boat pops it, you know. But generally speaking, um, there's two things you can do. One is we have them downstairs, they're like a little plastic thing, you wrap, wrap it around and just hold onto it. But it's quite hard to break 80 pound braid, as you probably mm. might know. Um, <coughs> generally, hopefully, you do crappy knots or something and it breaks at the knot in the bottom there. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but uh, it, it will generally break at the breakaway. So even though you've got 100 pound, you might be running 100 pound uh, lead like setup, the rig, it seems to always break down the bottom there. Which unfortunately, you lose your sinker. But I find 100 pound, um, you can, like I said, I pull a lot of my sinkers through whatever's down the bottom there, I get it back. Yeah, but if you're using 40 pounds, it's going to break straight away. You know? 100 pound tends to pull it out or it's stuck. The worst current for fish out there for losing sinkers is actually not strong current, it's actually no current. So especially around um, rib grounds and gyms, that's really bad. Out of the bottom there must be like volcanic sharp ridges sort of thing. 
and the rocks are gone. You just drift. Okay, oh, but there is, you're right, there is a, um, an app um, which is called, it's on there, I'll show you how it says. I think it's I O Y C or Y C. You've got those rip charts too, but they're for 800 bucks a year or something. Yeah. It's expensive. Oh, it's ridiculous. No, two and something. Oh, is it? Oh, still expensive. So there's two of them, it's rip charts and C, C something. Yeah, okay. And one's 250 and rip charts about 400. Okay, so. Because you've got all the charts these days, yeah, you don't need the chart definition because you can get it much cheaper on on uh, maybe on Apple or whatever. Um, but um, there's a free one which is a, I think it's IYOC 300, which I'll show you the stairs. Okay, if you guys get more down, we'll put your phone whatever. Um, but it's uh, free and it gives you a five days um, prognosis, and you can um, look at any area once to show all the areas. But areas obviously from about. Um, Gladstone down to here, sort of thing, or whatever. And it shows that area, and you can zoom in, of course, and it'll get, it'll show the what's happening with the current, and you can watch over the four days or five days what it's going to do the next three or four days. So at the moment, it's like uh, red sort of runs in summer, which is like three knots plus. Purple, I think, is four knots, which is like off the Richter scale, which it does a lot of the time. Um, just up to a couple of weeks ago, it was sort of like a yellow, which is like about 1.6 knots. But now it's, and then green, I think it's a knot, and light blue and blue is like less than a knot, which is at the moment just light blue at the front end, it's really calm. I haven't seen that for about a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a really good, good app, because it can save you a lot of fuel. Yeah. Unless you get trolling. Yeah. That's way right of boy off the lookout there too, though. They, they give you the, the car off that. yeah, you drive past it, and it's, and it's like swimming. <laughs> yeah, you can actually get the car off. Oh, can you get the car off again, oh, mate? No. Yeah, we oh, right, okay. The trouble is, like, you know, like so many times over like, many, so many years, we, like, going back years ago before we even had GPS and we didn't know, we just had to take the risk. Um, and you'd be on the 36 and it's absolutely raging, like, you know, pound of lead just like chunk at the back. You know, crap, we're not going to get a 50 today. And anyhow, we, it might be a glass out on ice, we just work our way out there, get out there, and it's straight down. So we get like back eddies here. Mm -hmm. And occasionally, but you don't want because it doesn't really work very well. But any car in here that runs sometimes north, it, it just doesn't work. Good for yellowfin too, you get the upwellings and stuff happening. But for um, for bottom fishing, it's terrible. Um, and same out there, we've been on um, 50 fathoms and it's been raging. I go a bit further to 200 metres and there's nothing. Yeah, it's really weird how it works. Yeah. But when that when it's summertime though, November to particularly say March or April, it's just solid. Three knots <laughs> or four knots. Like okay, whales. Are, okay, whales are a problem when you're going out in winter because it doesn't get daylight till six, quarter past six. So every time we get my friends, they want me to drive the boat. So it's like whale work, the eyes peel. And we leave always at four in the morning or five in the morning, so it's pretty dark. A couple of times I've had whales come out in front of us and just turn the boat and rip back the throttle at the same time. But um, you just got to be really careful, yeah. For those of you who've got the luxury of having that flow, the camera thing, system, my mate's got that in his boat, and uh, that's incredible. You can see the whales jumping over in front of you. Very expensive. Yeah, 20 grand or something. Thank you for a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah I might put a good one on. We were at the Sea Bay one recently. I was driving his boat, and it's like, um, you can see every rock, you can see everything as you're going through the Sea Bay. And, uh, and then um, I got to the end of the Sea Bay, and there's got a few boats doing donuts, and near the swell's quite big. The glass of rain outside too, and uh, I just looked and I see this big black thing on the floor. I, I think that's a wave. <laughs> so we bailed it back in, and then the, then the sun just started to crack, and it's just like white water, white water. <laughs> so they are very good, very good. You put it on because you hit a boat in the dark. That wasn't that, didn't have lights on. Okay, so I think that's about it, gentlemen. So. Um, if you want to invest in a electric, we will look after you. Um, if you want to use what you got, give it a shot. Um, and um, if you put a rig together tonight, I can I will guarantee you get so many fish. There are so many fish out there, guys. So it's just ridiculous. It is a whole new frontier. I'm hoping it lasts quite a while because um, things have got more modern, especially the sounder side of things. There's not that much just out here. Out. Where you see all the little boats. Oh, I know. That's, yeah, that's a different story. Yeah. Yeah.
they want to talk about San Francisco. San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> but for all that, why that's fantastic. Is, is there any difference with the with the swell and the conditions if you go past the hundred? Like we'd be fishing yeah. like getting comfortable with the one twenty. Yep. Is it any different to go fishing three, four hundred, you know, meters? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just I think I said last time, but that's us, that's point lookout, that's three heads, and that's